Okay, good morning, Mongolia, good evening, Canada, and welcome to Canada Mongolia Mining Conference. My name is Tatiana Demlovskaya. I'm director of Canada Eurasia Chamber of Commerce, Vancouver chapter, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm opening this meeting from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of Musqueam people. Today's conference is organized on the margins of PDAC as the part of our mining series 2022. We work with Mongolia for over five years, but this is the first time when we are having such comprehensive country focused session. I would like to recognize our partners who provided a significant input into this conference content, the Pacific Regional Office of Global Affairs Canada, Canadian Embassy to Mongolia and Embassy of Mongolia to Canada, Mongolia Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry and University of British Columbia. I also would like to express our gratitude to the sponsors of this mining series. Our gold sponsors are Condor Petroleum, E2 Gold and Chemical, and bronze sponsor is Arax Minerals. Before we start the conference, I would like to give a few household remarks as the host of this event. Our agenda today includes four parts, welcome remarks, two speaker panels, and Q&A session. If you have any questions to the speakers, please type them into Q&A box underneath of, use of, of your screen. Please use the Q&A box, not uh, the chat one. Uh, because chat one will be uh, deactivated. They will be either asked, the questions will be either asked at uh, Q&A or responded in written. Please indicate your name and company when sending the question. I also would like to mention that this event will be recorded and available for watching in a few days at CECC YouTube page. All presentations, as well as the detailed conference brochure, will be posted on the web page of this event. And now let's uh, open the first session. I would like to introduce the moderator of welcome remarks, Satinder Baines, a representative of our long-term member, Miller Thompson Law Company. Providing advice to clients on various customs uh, programs, Satinder has close to 20 years of work experience in international trade and custom regulations, helping customers to developing duty minimization strategies, mitigating custom risks, and navigating through countervailing and anti-dumping investigations. The Tinder, the stage is yours. Okay. Uh, first of all, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I'd like to offer a warm welcome to everybody participating in this uh, Canada Mongolia, Mongolia Mining Conference. Um, first of all, I'd like to recognize our honored guest today, which is the Ambassador to, of Canada to Mongolia, Catherine Ivkov, and of course, the Ambassador of Mongolia to Canada, Ambassador Aaron Bold. The purpose of this session is to discuss mining in Mongolia, as well as innovations and uh, sustainable development. Our, president, our presenters will provide a wealth, of, a wealth of information, but here's a quick primer. Mining is the engine of the Mongolian economy and it provides big opportunities for Canadian mining suppliers. There are key areas of opportunity. The key areas of opportunity include green and digital mining solutions, mineral exploration technologies, mining site productivity. Canada is the largest foreign investor in Mongolia. Uh, investment is supported by the uh, Canada-Mongolian Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement or FIPA. I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing uh, more from our terrific panels about the opportunities of mines in Mongolia, the opportunities across the mining supply chain. And I'm also excited to learn today and, and hope uh, you find these uh, sessions uh, productive and useful. Our first speaker is Giles Breton. He's been the uh, chairman of the National Board of the Canada Eurasia Russia Business Association uh, since uh, 2017. He's retired from government in uh, 2012 and after a 36 uh, year career with Canada Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Of the last three postings, his last three postings were at the Canadian Embassy in Moscow. He held the position of Minister Councillor and Deputy Head of uh, Mission from 2008 to 2012. From 1994 to 1997, 
He was the, uh, as a, he held a position as an international civil servant. He was a deputy director of the OSCE Officer for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights based in Warsaw, Poland. He also served as deputy director responsible for Canada's relations with Russia from 2000 to 2008. His uh, previous postings in Moscow were from 1983 to 1986 and from 1989 to 1999, 1991. Uh, Giles, you're on. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Excellencies, dear participants, as the chairman of the National Board of the Canada Eurasia Chamber of Commerce, I am delighted to welcome you to the Canada Mongolia Mining Conference 2022. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Algonquin Nation. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territory. This is all the more fitting, of course, to, since we are in Canada celebrating the, our National Indigenous Peoples Day, which I think is a very important and, and relatively new thing. Uh, but I would say also this is all the more inspiring since I happen to sit in an area that is an, an ancient trade route yeah, and a point of contact between different nations, the Ottawa River uh, at the confluence with Laliev River. So it's very inspiring to sort of speak from here, if I may say. At CECC, we are developing modern trade routes using a new name for the organization and a new name that, that better reflects the reality of our organization and its geographic coverage. Although geographic names all have their shortcomings, we would like to hope that our partners in Mongolia feel that they are most welcome members of the newly minted CECC. Uh, through the time-tested and highly effective TDAC and, and the Association for Mineral Exploration Environments, we have organized this year's Canada Eurasia Mining Series. The fact that many of us could meet last week in Toronto allows us to say that we're now operating in what might be called an hybrid format. But even more important, our meeting in Toronto refreshed our common enthusiasm for promoting greater cooperation. While we continue to have our traditional discussions around mining specific issues, we are as well addressing the new challenges of sustainable develop development in an unstable and rapidly changing world. As is most often the case with our seminars, of course, we have a very substantial program and a limited amount of time. So I will return the virtual microphone to our moderator to introduce the next speaker. And I wish you a most productive participation in this mining conference uh, for Canada Mongolia 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giles. Uh, our second speaker is Ambassador Catherine Ivkov. Um, she's from the university. Uh, she's uh, got her political science degree from the University of uh, Western Ontario. Uh, she joined uh, the Department of Foreign, Her Foreign Affairs and International Trade in 2003. Uh, she was an uh, officer on the Russia desk in the Eastern European Division from 2004 to 2006, and a legal officer in the United Nations Human Rights and Humanitarian Law Section from 2010 to 2012. Uh, she served in Russia from 2006 to 2010 as uh, Second Secretary, and in Kazakhstan from 2012 to 2015, as a political, political counselor. Uh, most recently, she's been the uh, deputy director of the uh, economic law section. Uh, Catherine, if you could please. Good morning and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much to the Canada Eurasia Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to participate in the conference today. Regional Director Tatiana Domilovskaya, Chair, Monsieur Breton, your Excellency, Ambassador Ehrenbold, distinguished guests. It is wonderful to be here with all of you today for the Canada Mongolia Mining Conference for 2022. I had the privilege of attending PDAC in person in Toronto last week. And I think that all of us who were there could really feel the energy uh, and the excitement of being back in person after a two year absence. And I really think that that energy is going to continue with today's conference, talking about possibilities in mining between Canada and Mongolia. The mining sector is of strategic importance to Mongolia, as we know. It accounts for over 30% of its GDP, and it touches many other sectors indirectly. 
This conference now comes at a very critical time as Mongolia is preparing to further open its mining sector to international mining exploration companies. We often say that similar climates and geographies make Canada and Mongolia natural partners and perhaps nowhere else is this description more true than in our commercial and bilateral relations within the mining sector. Canada is very proud to be a leading partner of Mongolia in the mining sector. As Satinder already mentioned, Canada is Mongolia's largest foreign investor and our joint efforts have led to many important deposit discoveries. Perhaps the most well-known example is the Oyutolgoi copper gold mine in the South Gobi. Canada has been a part of Oyutolgoi's story from the very beginning. The Canadian company Ivanhoe Mines, which is now called Turquoise Hill Resources, initially discovered the copper ore deposits in 2001. The Oyutolgoi project has now become the largest internationally managed project in Mongolia's history. The whole project is worth approximately 13 billion US dollars. Export Development Canada has provided $1 billion in financing toward the Oyutolgoi project in support of Turquoise Hills investment and Canadian supply to Oyutolgoi. The project is expected to produce approximately 500,000 tons of copper annually once it is at full production. This project provides significant export revenue, high paying jobs, as well as tax revenue for Mongolia. My most recent visit to Oyutolgoi was just a number of weeks ago. I was really amazed at the further development of the mine since my last visit. But my visit also emphasized to me that in addition to the massive economic importance of Oyutolgoi, this project brings huge benefits in human development with the incredible professional and career development opportunities it offers to men and women in Mongolia. Another example of our joint cooperation with Mongolia, as Satinder also mentioned, is the Canada-Mongolia Foreign Investor Investment Protection and Promotion Agreement, otherwise known as the FIPA, which provides ground rules and protections for Canadians investing in Mongolia and vice versa. And this agreement went into effect in March 2017. But Canada-Mongolia cooperation in mining is not only about the commercial relationship. We enjoy an equally vibrant partnership in international and technical cooperation. Many of you may be aware of the Canadian funded development assistance project, Mongolia Enhancing Resource Management Through Institutional Transformation or MERIT project. You will hear more about MERIT in this conference. This project aims to improve public sector management of the Mongolian extractive sector at both the national and local level in order to maximize its contribution to sustainable economic and social development. So our cooperation with Mongolia is twofold. It works both commercially and through our development programs. Our goal is to get sound resource projects built that will create good jobs, healthy industries, and sustainable prosperity for generations to come. And to do this the right way with an environmental and regulatory system that is open and transparent. One that ensures modern safeguards, is inclusive and advances community engagement as well as supports economic development for Mongolians across the country. Now I will say a few words about Canadian minerals development practice and experience. Canada's history demonstrates that the extractive sector can really help build a country. Our extractive sector companies in the mining, oil and natural gas industries make a major contribution to Canadian prosperity and are making substantial contributions to economic development in the countries in which they operate around the world. Canada is a mining jurisdiction and has been for over 200 years. Canada's mining industry has played a major role in the economic development of our country. It is clear that mining and the development of the Canadian infrastructure and financial industries are interrelated. Our success in the mining sector is based on principles that support the rule of law, 
transparent financing and taxation, community engagement, sound environmental management, and mine closure practices. As Minister Wilkinson underlined in his opening remarks at PDAC in Toronto, we know that we must move forward in consultation with Indigenous peoples and in an environmentally sustainable manner, taking positive climate action for economic prosperity. This is the way forward in Canada as well as in Mongolia. We know that by following these key principles, we can strengthen the investment climate and enhance environmental stewardship and thus create more jobs and grow the economy for decades to come. In Canada, the results speak for themselves. In 2020, the minerals sector directly and indirectly accounted for 700,000 jobs throughout the country in urban, rural, and remote regions. The value of Canada's mineral production reached $43.8 billion, and it directly and indirectly contributed over $100 billion, or 3%, to Canada's total nominal GDP. And so Canada has a lot of valuable experience and lessons learned to share with Mongolia in exchange for learning from Mongolia's best practices as well. Over the decades, we have learned more and more about how to manage our extractive sector resources in a modern economy. And we are pleased for the opportunity to share and exchange on what we and what Mongolia has learned. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with Mongolia on these issues. I want to thank you again for the invitation to be here today. And I hope that everyone enjoys the conference and finds it a successful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, our third speaker is uh, Ambassador Arnbold, um, who joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1995 as an attache in the uh, Councillor Department. He moved uh, on to the embassy in New Delhi in 2000 and returned as Deputy Director of the uh, Councillor Department. In 2008, he became the head of the counselor section at the embassy in China. And three years later, he was sent to Hong Kong and Macau as consul general. In 2013, he became counselor in the Department of Public Administration at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And a year later, he became de deputy director of Department of Public Diplomacy. He was a uh, director of the counselor department when he received his postings in Canada. The amb ambassador has a master's degree in law, economics and information technology. He's married, has three children. He speaks Mongolian, Russian, and English. So please, Ambassador Arnbold, uh, if you can proceed. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation, of uh, excellent presentation. And uh, Chairman Mr. Burton and his team, Ambassador Yifko, distinguished guests and friends, it's my great honor to deliver opening remarks at the Canada Mangala Mining Conference 2022. I wish to begin by thanking the Canada Eurasia Chamber of Commerce for organizing this meaningful conference and convening mining community and officials from all around the world. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the modern mining industry in Mongolia, I wish to congratulate you everyone on this jubilee attending this conference. I just mentioned by the Ambassador Ifko, with billions of dollars invested, the Utala mining project is a testimony of successful Mongolia Canada investment cooperation. I am pleased to emphasize the government of Mongolia and the Riyadh Integrity to move forward the Utala project, commencing its underground operations. I welcome all investors and miners to benefit from the opportunities that Mongolia offers. Once again, thank you everyone for joining the conference. I wish this conference for productive deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for the, your brief comments. Um, I'm gonna turn this over back to Tatania so she can uh, proceed with the rest of the presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for, um, for your input. And uh, hopefully this will be a, a great uh, presentation for everybody. Thanks. So um, our first panel comes under the title Mining in Mongolia, and I'm honored to introduce our moderator for this panel, Dr. Julian Dirks. Uh, Dr. Dirks is probably one of the uh, best informed person about Mongolia across Canada. 
Um, uh, Dr. Dirks is uh, an associate professor and the key, the, uh, key dendron uh, chair in Japanese uh, research at the University of British Columbia Institute of Asian Research and uh, associate professor at UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. He has focused much of his uh, research on contemporary Mongolia in the last 15 years and visits the country regularly in non-pandemic times. Dr. Dirks uh, is particularly interested in democratization and mining governance in Mongolia. He is one of the principal authors of the Mongolia Focus blog, and he tweets at J. Dirks. Uh, Dr. Dirks, the stage is yours. Please don't forget to, to switch off your microphone. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I've got my mic on, so I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the unceded ancestral uh, lands of uh, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish peoples. And many thanks to Gilles Breton for pointing out that it was Indigenous Peoples Day important to remember, especially as he mentioned in the context of these global discussions that were locally rooted in that way, and that territorial relations matter for these uh, for these discussions. Uh, we're off here to speak about mining in Mongolia. Um, many of you might not know, it's the 100th anniversary of industrial mining in Mongolia this year. Uh, December 2022, the coal mine in Nalakh opened um, in 1922, that is, uh, in Nalakh, uh, now a suburb of Ulaanbaatar. And of course, that coal mine powered the construction of, of Ulaanbaatar as a, as, a, as a capital city, as a resident capital city for many years. Um, and then it was added to by projects right, um, around, Mong uh, around Ulaanbaatar, but elsewhere. Bagandua is another large coal mine that's right on the outskirts. Uh, and so mining has been very much a history of a uh, part of Mongolians' modern history uh, through the state socialist period, of course, into the 1970s, when the joint Soviet Mongolian project in Adnet really started powering the Mongolian economy, but also serving as uh, very much as a, an embodiment of modernity and of industrialization. Um, this all then led, of course, to the 1990 democratic revolution and the adoption of, of more capitalist market um, practices that led to a, a more of a mining boom in the early 2000s. And so what we're, when we're looking at the contemporary scene today, um, and we really have a, a bit of an all-star cast of people to look at that in, in, this, in this panel, uh, we're looking back on 100 years of history, uh, but lots of changes in governance, um, obviously in technology, in the kind of minerals that Mongolian mining has been focused on. Um, and in other contexts. Um, and so on that history, then this panel uh, will focus on, on sort of a high level overview of, um, of the mining sector in Mongolia. Uh, and we've got insights from all sectors that you'd want to hear from. Uh, we've got representatives uh, of government who also happen to be academics. Uh, we've got some corporate actors, both small and large and international. Uh, and we've got um, civil society connected uh, Canadians involved in the, in the conversations today as well. Um, so I think we're off to a wonderful start, and we've got a, a real star to get us going uh, in Uyanga. Um, I, I teach at a school of public policy and global affairs. <laughs> Uyanga is a, is a dream academic to us because uh, she's got a, a really strong academic pedigree with her PhD and, and the postdoc beyond that, uh, but has chosen to contribute to, to national development now and has got herself involved in the government drawing on her experience as a, as a field geologist, but now being involved much more with policymaking activities um, at the mining ministry and, and, and the geological um, agency. Uyanga, um, Ambassador Ifkov already mentioned that um, Mongolia is re revisiting perhaps exploration licenses and the like. I have a suspicion and kind of hope that that's an area you're gonna talk about. And so over to you, uh, you've got about 10 minutes. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, can you guys all hear me okay? Today I'll be talking about uh, a presentation that I've prepared for PDAC and, uh, and, and it's gonna touch base on uh, what the government of Mongolia is pursuing in the years to come. And it will also include some information about um, uh, mineral exploration license granting procedures that we've recently updated. Um, so I'll go ahead and I hope I won't bore those of you who have listened to my talk before. Uh, so on behalf of the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry, I'll present the Mongolian potential as a commodity supplier in the green, green transition era. And then before I delve further, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the mineral sector of, to the Mongolian economy. So as of uh, the 2021 statistics, 24% of the GDP comes from mining, 
67% of the industrial sector is the mining industry, and 76% of the direct foreign investment comes in through mining in the country as well. And 93% of the total export relates to the mining sec mineral sector. So the specific numbers can be generalized as shown in the blue box on your right, starting from issuing mineral exploration licenses, a specific tonnages of commodities and products for export, and products we as a country imported from overseas. And at the end of 2021, to revive the Mongolian economy, the parliament passed an, the new revival policy to encourage Mongolia's post-pandemic recovery by opening up the country to domestic and foreign investment. And towards the end of this presentation, I'll show the estimated expected outcome for these specific numbers that should result from the um, successful implementation of the new revival policy. So we recommend Mongolian territory for foreign investors in the mineral sector as prospective for finding mineral deposits of all sorts. And the reason is that we occupy a vast land in the center of Central Asia, and it encompasses wide varieties of landforms, studied geoscientifically on small scales, identified as having high potential in hosting many mineral, important minerals, including gold, copper, metallurgical coal, various elements, and battery minerals. And if we take a look at Central Asian, if you take a look at actual the geological work and how it actually is done in the country. So if we start with Central Asian geology, uh, in general, Central Asian geology is worth study, studying scientifically as it represents a land mass related to the largest continental growth in Earth's history. So growing continental mass means complicating the geology with structures such as faults, fractures, changes due to temperature rise and volcanism and magmatism. And all of these processes related to the mineralization of exciting minerals. And in the end of the day, that's actually what we need. And here I'm superimposing different scales of basic geological research data. So the darker the blue color, the more detailed research data exists to help find mineral deposits per se. And as assumed, large scale known deposits are actually identified and documented and found on them. And in more scientific terms, I can say that our land the entire territory of Mongolia is not studied enough. So it means that compared to the US and Australia that I show on the, on the right, where much more detailed works have been done, we're at a preliminary stage. So to identify and find mineral occurrences and deposits, we should, under, we should actually study the entire territory um, as uh, large as one, two, uh, 10,000, 5,000, or even 25,000 scale geologic research work would actually help. So there's actually much more to learn from our territory regarding mineralization potential. And also I um, added the known deposit locations of all types of minerals found both in Russia and China with these colored dots here. And as you can see, China has studied its land in great detail which resulted in many of these deposits that we actually can see just outside our border. So, but even so many scientists have identified in Mongolia, the great potential in the country and it's gold, copper, iron, rare earth elements, lithium, cobalt, nickel mineralization, so-called the battery minerals. And you will be able to find many publications online or I can also point you to um, many of them after the speech. But with the current state of our mineral sector, 30% of the state revenues formed from mining related income. And um, um, we have estimated mineral resources, of course, for copper, coal, iron, gold, crude oil, et cetera. You can see the specific numbers on the right as well. But uh, even with this information that we, or what we can um, get within the country, we do have abundant mineral resources as of now. And 
for all of the geologists who, who are listening to my talk today, I just wanted to present this slide showing the tectonics of um, critical minerals, rare earth deposits, and perspective of uh, Central Asian geology. And um, if we actually agree on this framework, we can actually persuade our um, the higher ups, and hopefully they can also persuade the investors. And uh, if we happen to find or identify rare earth element deposits within the country, then it will help supply the increasing demand in the field. So the blue region um, just south of Central Asian Orogenic Vault, which is shown in uh, green, globally we find uh, several large scale rare earth element deposits. For example, the buying of our rare earth element deposits in North China, Mianan Chen Belt Wall in China, and also a deposit in uh, Anamhad deposit here, and also a deposit in Afghanistan as well. But as we happen to know that there are several deposits in South Gobi as well, which is actually on the green on Central Asia, which also speaks that there is um, there is high potential for this green region as well. And that's where scientists who study rare earth element mineralization are paying more attention to. And that's exciting for us as Mongolia occupies the central part of the green region. And if we now zoom into Mongolia itself, um, although I'm um, cutting everything by um, Mongolian boundary in geological terms, it's not the case. But the geologists have actually identified these yellow regions with all these um, uh, dots here, which show uh, mineralized locations for a uh, rare earth element um, and also some other metal uh, mineralization points. And the scientists have actually identified that these yellow regions have high potential for further studying. And the South Gobi rare earth element deposits are actually identified by these three different um, deposits here. Unfortunately, these six blue stars, which represent uh, deposits for rare earth elements, they're not being mined at the moment for all sorts of reasons, and hopefully they'll actually come into play. And as you can see, with regards to high-tech minerals, including rare earth elements and battery minerals, uh, there, there are large um, areas, regions within the country that are actually dim potential, but need further studies in the country. And hopefully in the years to come, uh, people would start identifying uh, mineral deposits and um, other sorts of uh, mineral mineralization in the country. And now if we actually uh, go to a uh, specific regulation that our moderator has uh, touched base on, on mineral exploration tenement tendering process, the government of Mongolia is um, encouraging investors, um, exploration companies to do further work on uh, potential regions that are identified within the country. And um, the first attempt in doing so was to ease the actual process to apply for mineral exploration tenement within the country. And we're actually doing that by, um, uh, by uh, digitalizing all of the entire process uh, from uh, application for uh, tenement tendering and the entire process is actually fully transparent. You can see all the steps on a platform that's uh, jointly uh, collaborate in collaboration and in orga jointly organized with the state procurement system that's been in uh, action for the last 10 years. And this year we have prepared to announce uh, tenements for tender in a region that actually occupies more than 3 million hectares in the country. And um, we, we are hoping to start, um, start uh, this uh, tendering process in a few days to come. And um, hopefully, um, in, uh, because through this process, we have uh, uh, deduced the number of days to actually get expression license granted from 45 days, maximum of 45, days to maximum 10 days and hopefully this summer there will be more mineral exploration tenements uh, granted to uh, exploration companies and uh, with that hopefully there will be more activities happening on the ground.
And for those of you who actually uh, would like to understand the geology and the specific data that's uh, available on the ground, the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry and the two implementing agencies, uh, the Mineral Resources and Petroleum Authority of Mongolia, the National Geological Survey of Mongolia, we are putting together uh, this platform where we are making all of the geological point data available for the public. And uh, there are several uh, steps you can follow, but basically from the official website of the ministry, you can access uh, the, the several places where you can see where um, the regions are studied in detail, who have actually done the work and what kind of data available for the public. And throughout the summer, we'll actually be adding in a lot of point data. Um, and because we're emphasizing a uh, lot of potential for uh, the critical minerals itself, I just wanted to share this information where we're making even the petrographic description for interesting uh, locations that may be potential for rare earth element mineralization online. So basically you can actually see the entire um, collection of geological reports available. And you can actually access the petrographic descriptions of each um, that unit that's described as um, interesting for mineralization potential, et cetera. And that's all becoming public um, in, the, in English. So hopefully you guys can review the data yourself and apply for tenements that are going to be starting soon. And then hopefully for our government, we'll start seeing a lot of activities on ground. And now if I actually reinsert the slides that I've shown you before, I've shown the two third of the slide before, and, and then include uh, the, the expected numbers that we should see after the successful implementation of the new revival policy, this looks like this. So the total area that we're going to um, uh, grant for exploration is actually more than 3 million hectares alone this year. And hopefully this will change in the number of years to come. And the products that we export uh, in terms of copper concentrate, uh, metallurgical coal, gold, steel, we estimate the numbers to go up high, three, two to threefold. And also the um, products that we use to import for domestic use hopefully we'll start producing them. And not only, not only we uh, stop importing them, hopefully we'll also start um, uh, exporting them in the, in the, by 2025. So that's the grand plan. And if you guys have further questions, uh, please do let me know. So thank you. Wonderful, young Gavin. Thank you very much. So that gives us a great sense of both the geology and the potential, but also of, of government's efforts um, for to facilitate interaction with that geology. Um, it's a great way to start us off. Uh, we'll go next to Bigun, and Bigun, of course, represents uh, a connection to that geology because he works with Adin Resources, a, a Canadian-based company that has been long engaged in exploration um, in, in Mongolia. Bigun, I think you're out in the Maritimes, aren't you? So here in Vancouver, I think I'm about halfway between you and Mongolia. So uh, what does the world look like from the Maritimes? Good. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Dirks. Um, I'm actually uh, in Ulaanbaatar right now. Yes, the company is headquartered in, uh, in uh, the Maritimes in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I was just recently. Um, and I've also had the pleasure of attending the, the PDAC conference in Toronto. Um, along with many of the, the attendees over here. So um, good morning to, to some in Mongolia and good evening to the folks um, who are in, in Canada. Um, thank you, um, Professor, for giving us the opportunity to present and thanks for the organizers, um, the opportunity to present Erdin. And, uh, you know, just, I was, I was watching uh, Mrs. Oyunga's presentation and was wondering how much area in Mongolia is so underexplored. And Erdin over the past, um, past uh, 18 years, focusing on that specific underexplored areas in the country and actually coming up with, you know, the, actually being rewarded for taking the risk of, of going out there and then um, uncovering what is known right now as the, the new up and coming um, gold district. Um, believe, it, uh, believe it or not, it's a group of several gold deposits in a, in a very small, proximity area. So I'm excited to 
to share this um, development with you guys today and then um, and go through this presentation as briefly as possible. I do, I do understand that there is um, there's a time limit on this presentation. So thank you, everyone. I will be making some forward looking statements associated with this presentation. So as um, as introduced by Mrs. Oyunga, um, you know, this uh, Western, mid Midwestern part of, of Mongolia was, I saw in her presentation, quite less explored. Um, and then, you know, this is exactly where we, we focused. However, when we focus on this low, um, you know, underexplored regions within the country, we also need to overlap the area with the known uh, gold and copper hosting rock types. And, you know, if, um, I believe many of the, the, the participants understand that the, the Central Asia organic belt that goes through the, the Uzbekistan's and the Kyrgyzstan's and Kazakhstan's goes also through Mongolia as well um, and wraps around the Mongolian um, southern uh, portion um, and then you know makes up those very well-known deposits such as Oyotozwa and Saransorga. However, we did decide to focus since 2009 on this trans Altai uh, trans Adrian train. And uh, this is where we are making our uh, gold discoveries. So here's our um, license holding. Um, we do have three licenses where we're making uh, multiple uh, new discoveries. Um, in the northern part, this is an Altenar license. We've made our initial discovery over here back in 2012. In the south, going maybe 16 kilometers from the Aftenar deposit, um, we have the Bayanghundi as well as the Olan systems. Throughout this presentation, I will be going back and forth with, between these license holdings. So it's, uh, please get your bearings right on these discoveries. However, we continue to find new gold within this uh, 20 kilometer diameter area. Um, just to hit on Aftenar first, um, Aftenar was discovered back in 2012. By the way, Aftenar in Mongolian means the golden sun in English. Um, in 2012, we stumbled upon this very large um, uh, golden soil um, anomaly, basically, a mineralized corridor. This mineralized corridor is, is very big. Uh, it runs from northwest to uh, southeast and creates about 5.6 kilometers of gold trend. Um, we have identified 18 separate targets within that 5.6 kilometer area. We've only focused on three areas and uh, by 2019, we've um, identified about half a million ounces of, of gold resources at uh, a significantly elevated grade of 1.9 grams per ton. Um, however, unfortunately to the Aftenar uh, project, and fortunately to Erdin, we have also identified uh, a separate discoveries in, uh, to the south of this, um, uh, of this very large mineralized system by Hundi. So Aftenar really did not um, experience the kind of exploration that it should have gone through um, if, you know, if this was the only discovery. So in 2015, we shifted our focus from Aftenar to the north to uh, Bayamundi in the south. However, just wanted to highlight Aftenar at, at the front end because it is a very large system that is you know, very much unexplored for. It is a gold and polymetallic deposit, meaning that it uh, hosts gold, silver, um, lead, and zinc. Um, but there is significantly more exploration work that needs to be done on Aftenar. Now, going south to uh, Bayamundi in Oldan, uh, Bayamundi is Bayonde actually sits on the southwestern edge of the Hundi mining license. Um, you can see over here, um, as I'm pointing with this red pointer, Bayonde was first identified back in 2015. Where we've developed it to a bankable feasibility stage by 2020. It is a shovel ready, um, high grade, open pitable project right now um, that we're advancing towards production. Hopefully, we get to see uh, production coming out of uh, Bayonde. Um, in early 2024, as our um, as our current plan is, I will be uh, going much more into detail in Bayonde later. But just wanted to highlight uh, the the new discoveries in the periphery of Bayonde. If you go uh, maybe 2.4 kilometers to the north of Bayonde, we have the Dark Horse Prospect um, that is very quickly turning into a, a deposit right now. Um, and then just maybe th uh, 300 meters to the west of Bayonde, we have our Olan gold discovery as well. So I will be talking about this discoveries very briefly right now. Um, if you look at Bayonde, um, the overall um, resource, geological resource that we've identified at 
at Bayonhundi is just a little over 600,000 ounces of gold um, at a very high grade of over two grams per ton. However, from this 600,000 ounces of gold, we have identified 400,000 ounces of gold within the, the constrained open pit. And they, you know, these uh, 400,000 ounces of uh, reserves that you know, has uh, 3.7 grams per ton average grade, which really puts this deposit on, uh, on the investor's map in terms of uh, uniqueness, because the higher the grade is, the more profitable the mining operation will be. Um, moving 300 meters west of Bayonhundi, we have the Ulan gold, uh, gold discovery. Now Ulan, um, actually this, uh, this area that we're looking at sits on the, the southeastern corner of Ulan. Um, we are hitting perhaps the thickest um, and the thickest gold mineralization in this area. The latest um, results that we were able to um, able to release to the to our investors were 41 meters of 8.1 grams per ton um, and then uh, 23 grams of 13 grams per ton. Um, so it's it's a very high grade that we're hitting. However, one key characteristic uh, characteristic of Ulan discovery compared to Bayanghundi is that whereas Bayanghundi is mineralization starts from the surface and goes to maybe about 15, uh, 150 meters at depth. Wolan's mineralization starts maybe from 70 to 90 meters at depth, and then it continues downwards to well over 300 meters uh, at depth. So potentially uh, Bayonhundi mineralization, you know, dipping southwest towards Wolan, you know, uh, the mineral, uh, mineralized area, the ore thickness is increasing. So it, you know, there's significantly much more gold to be found at the land, and we do have additional um, additional results pending. Now, if you look at Bayanhundi Dark Horse and Ulan um, deposits as a whole, um, we believe our, our technical team believe, believes that these three new gold discoveries are actually associated with the Ulan hydrothermal um, complex. So, if you look at the Ulan license. I'm sorry, I should put, put things into perspective. On this satellite image, we are looking from the, the west side to the east. So Dark Horse is, is in the north, Bayonhundi in the south, Ulan to the west. So if, and we're uh, looking down to the Ulan license. Right in the center of the Ulan license, there is an intense philic alteration core, which we believe is associ uh, associated with a uh, um, porphyry type of uh, deposit. Um, and then this is, you know, potentially this is created, this has created this porphyry type of feeder zone that has created this epithermal um, gold deposits uh, closer to the surface. However, our technical team does believe there is uh, a chance that this uh, Ulan um, field alteration does have a porphyry um, exploration potential at depth. However, we haven't done the, the exploration at depth to date because it has been so much easier for us to be finding gold at surface right now. Um, this is a, a soil anomaly, a golden soil anomaly for Dark Horse uh, going uh, 2.4 kilometers to the north from the Bayonhundi Bi deposit. Um, the Dark Horse uh, discovery um, what makes the Dark Horse discovery much more interesting for us is, the, is its high-grade nature. And also, just recently, we're identifying more oxidized gold over here. That means it will just complement Bayonhundi's um, development and Bayonhundi's economic, economics that much better. Um, Dark Horse actually does create this one kilometer long trend uh, going from north to south um, that's mineralized. And mineralization starts from the surface. Again, going down to maybe 50 to, uh, to 70 meters at depth. Um, still, uh, Dark Horse remains open to be, you know, mineralization remains open to be extended towards depth. We just haven't done the drilling yet. Um, again, very high, uh, high grade gold uh, found in very thick zones, um, oxidized, meaning that it's going to just complement Bayonhundi. It makes Bayonhundi's mining and economics of the deposit much more easier. Um, so, just going back from these three licenses, on these three licenses, we have identified approximately 1.1 million ounces of gold equivalents to date, uh, and that's our 2019 resource number. Um, we have made it into our target um, uh, for 2022 to increase our um, 
our license-wide or company-wide resource number to 2 million ounces. And we believe uh, with um, the dark horse and Olan discoveries and additional resources that at Bayonghundi, we're well on our target to hit this 2 million um, gold resource target for this, uh, for this year. Now, going a bit further on the, uh, on the Bayonghundi um, development side, um, what makes Bayonghundi much more special um, is its high grade nature. Um, throughout uh, the world, the open pit gold mines, you know, uh, the average grade is about one grams per ton. Um, however, we are looking at 3.7 grams per ton for buying Hundi, which makes it a much more compelling story for many investors to be buying shares and investing into uh, to your dean. Um, this is a, a planned concept drawing for buying Hundi mine site development. It's a rather Simple, uh, small scale, small footprint, uh, small impact environmentally um, type of mine that we have planned, our, our engineers have planned. Our process plant is uh, will utilize uh, carbon and, and pulp technology. Um, it's, a, it's a rather moderate sized plant um, that does have a capacity to um, process about 1800 tons of ore per day. As you can see by on the open pit over here, open pit strength length is about 800 meters. We are planning a, a dry stack tailings uh, facility um, that in, involves the, the open pit waste as well uh, together with um, the process plant waste. Um, we're also envisioning the first um, renewable energy power solution um, partially uh, for this mine development. Um, we have completed a bankable feasibility study for buying Hundi in 2020. Um, you know, our bankable feasibility study envisions uh, a very low capex and high economic impact project. At the current gold prices, uh, the net present value of this project is about $274 million. Um, on average, uh, for the uh, for the six-year mine life, producing uh, a little over 60,000 ounces of gold per year. Um, just to put things into perspective, the, the company Erdine right now is altogether valued at maybe $100 million. So it does provide the significant upside potential for this, um, well, upside potential this project provides to Erdine shareholders. Um, so my are... apologies, but I'll be held responsible for letting the session run way over. <laughs> can, um, Absolutely, can I'm sorry about go this. Um, All good. Yeah, I will, I will cut my presentation short. I'm just finishing right now. Um, yeah, Professor, sorry, I didn't uh, realize that the time was well over, so I'll, I'll cut this short now. You want to just finish there? Thanks, Bilgen. Um, yes, uh, yeah, we're just, uh, just so that we don't mess with people's calendars too much. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting to hear, right, the, the on the ground version of this. Thank you for providing us that view into that, that longstanding project. Fascinating. Um, Batsenge, um, so one of the interesting things about Zoom is that you, you, you see people's faces, but you can't tell what kind of body they are. Now, Batsing and I would probably bet that we're both in the top three tallest people in this room, which you can't tell. Um, and he's used his height well, unlike me, uh, because he's a big basketball uh, supporter. And so, and you don't see this in his bio, but he's, he's been instrumental, for example, in bringing the Mongolian three-on-three -three basketball team to the Olympics, uh, to the Tokyo Olympics, the first Mongolian team that, that ever made it to the Olympics. And so he's got other things going on than what he's going to speak about today. Um, so um, Bigun spoke a bit about um, adding resources as an emerging, hope, hopefully soon producer. Batsenka represents energy resources, uh, one of the, by most accounts, best-run large Mongolian domestic companies in the mining sector, but he also represents the Mining Association. And so he, he's going to speak a bit more, I think, about currently already operating, um, producing miners uh, and the situation that they find themselves in. Batsenka, over to you. And ideally, 10 minutes if you can. Yeah, hi, Julian, and uh, good morning and good evening to everyone attending. And as uh, Julian just mentioned, I will talk in general about the mining sector and the mining environment, regulatory environment in Mongolia. And obviously I will leave more floor to the q &A session. And as I said, uh, I represent the uh, private sector and will also present the industry to you. Uh, Taran, can you share the, my presentation, please? Uh, so thank you for opportunity uh, to present Mongolian mining industry 
to Canadian uh, friends. And uh, let's go to the first slide. The next slide, please. And talking about Mongolia, obviously, I believe many people are familiar with country. Oh, sorry, you jumped. Uh, Mongolia is the North Central uh, Asian country, and we are sandwiched between Russia and China. In some extent, it's represent uh, challenges in terms of, especially now after this pandemic, last two years, we have seen that we are facing a lot of logistics issues to access the markets. And this would be the ongoing challenges, I think, continuing forward as well. Mongolia transitioned to the democratic uh, multi-party system in 1990. Uh, capital Ulaanbaatar and Mongolia has uh, over 1.5 billion square kilometer area, which is, I believe it's around the 18th or 19th largest country by uh, land mass area. Population is around uh, 3.4 million by last year estimations. Uh, country is unitary republic. Uh, it's consisting from capital city Ulaanbaatar and 21 IMAX or provinces. And we have parliament, 76 members elected for four year terms. And uh, head of state, president of Mongolia is elected by popular vote from all citizens. And uh, in last year, 2091, uh, uh, we have elected Ukhna representing Mongolian, nominated from Mongolian People's Party as the president for next six year term. And according to amendment of constitution, president is elected for six year term one time. And head of government is uh, obviously representing the, uh, the majority in the parliament. And currently the government is uh, led uh, by MPP, Mongolian People's Party and prime minister. Currently, Mr. Oyurden um, is serving as, a, as a, the prime minister of the Mongolia. Next slide, please. So talk about the economy, I think a uh, number of people already mentioned this, facts. Uh, GDP is around 14 billion by last year estimations. Per capita is represents around 4.2 uh, thousand US dollar per, per head. Inflation, it's around 15% reported in May 2022. It's a similar situation all around the world when we face now the higher inflation. Uh, Bank of Mongolia policy rate is kept at 9%, but I see that we also, because of this inflation situation, we will face the, the pressure to increase these rates. Currency, it's Mongolian Tugruk, uh, which is around three, uh, one US dollar, its uh, exchange rate is around 3,000 Mongolian Tugruks. Exports over one, 9 billion been reported in 21, uh, while imports been close to 7 billion. So Mongolia has positive trade balance over 2 billion, almost 2 billion, over 2 billion. And just to refer to the ADB report, obviously in 2020, as you can see on the top left side of the slide, uh, due to COVID pandemic, uh, economy shrank almost 5% recovered slightly in 2021, and modest recovery growth around 2% is expected in 2022, and much stronger over 5% growth is expected by ADB in 2023, when the country and main, the trade partner China, hopefully will be exiting this uh, pandemic situation. Uh, in terms of economic freedom score, Mongolia, uh, positioned according to Heritage Foundation data above the world and also regional Asia average, it's 63.9 score from 100 points. Uh, this score is judged by rule of law, government size, regulatory efficiency in upper markets. These reports are available publicly. So if you are interested, you will be able to access this by searching through the web. Next slide, please. And Again, mining industry, it's really vital for Mongolia and Mongolian economy. It uh, represents almost one third of budget income in 2021. GDP share, it's almost quarter of entire GDP is attributed to mining sector. Uh, but I need to mention what if you will add the other sectors which are servicing the mining industry, I think this share will be even larger. So industrial output share is almost 70%. It's again, the associated with processing and uh, 
other activities related to minerals. And it's really lion's share of the country's export uh, represented by, by mining products. It's uh, over 90% uh, consistently for last years. And if you look at top five export items by uh, monetary value in 2021, copper con concentrate was 31%, coal was 30%, iron ore 10%, gold 11%, and crude ore was representing 3%. So those are uh, main five commodities exported from Mongolia. In terms of trade partners, I think the main destination obviously logically is China, given the proximity uh, between Mongolia and China. And uh, obviously the economic situation in China, demand for commodities, it's really driving the, our mining sector. Next slide, please. In terms of mining regulations, of course, it's uh, quite complex and it's really dynamic. And first mine or minerals law was adopted actually in 1996. And this law actually was main driver for Mongolia's economic growth for next over 20, 25 years. For example, the OT project, which is the largest foreign investment managed by Rio Tinto in mining in entire uh, Mongolia. Uh, it was a uh, result of this law adopted in 1996. By this law, first time domestic and foreign investors being allowed to explore and exploit the commodities in Mongolia. And given the special permits at that time, exploration licenses and so on, the discoveries of deposits like Oyutolgo were made. And as uh, it was mentioned earlier, since early 2000, uh, investments put in our mining sector, and it's uh, coming now to the production stage in let's say early 2020. So it just shows the exploration and mining business is really long-term business. It requires decades of exploration and development before discovering and bringing to uh, full production level. So as mentioned also in this presentation, now country, uh, thanks to this uh, minerals law adopted in 1996, I believe, uh, we change it, transformed Mongolia, let's say from less than 1 billion US dollar economy 25 years ago. Now it's uh, getting over 10, close to uh, over 14 billion uh, GDP. And the next aim of country and of course government and its people, it's continued the growth. So do we like it or not like it? But I believe that given the position of Mongolia, the mining and mineral sector will be driving our growth for next decades as well. And uh, the legal framework, of course, includes the tax laws, labor law, land law, environmental protection law. And if you will be interested in doing business in Mongolia, of course, you will be getting the legal advices about uh, how it works. But in general, also, if you look at uh, the various reports, the taxation burden, it's relatively mild in Mongolia. Corporate income tax is 10% and 25%. The minerals law uh, sets the royalty, which is base royalty 5% and uh, plus progressive royalty linked to the commodity price and processing level. So a lot of uh, majority of the, the mineral products would have royalties somewhere around escalating five to 10%, uh, which is also comparable to the industry average, the worldwide, except copper. So I believe that, that our regulators will be considering this in order to promote more investments in the copper exploration. Uh, exploration licenses are issued for up to nine years term. And obviously it has escalating fees and minimum spending commitments in order to really uh, push for real exploration. Mining special permits once exploration uh, conducted the company can apply for mining uh, license. And if uh, it's adopted and approved, uh, is, uh, license is issued first time for 30 year term and it's extendable twice by 20 years. So it's overall up to 70 years mining rights will be assigned to the company. Uh, and obviously the company who made the exploration has preemptive rights to apply for this license in terms of exploiting the resources discovered. Also important aspect, of course, it's community engagement. And uh, one of the 
uh, amendments been made in the past to mining law, minerals law, what the community cooperation agreements are required to be signed between the companies and community uh, at Zoom or IMAC level, province level, uh, using the template adopted by government, which helps kind of the define the limits uh, and uh, reduce the misunderstanding between the community and, and, and the mining companies. So there are also public reports available about the governance and uh, other aspects related to mining in Mongolia. For example, you can see on this slide, resource governance index published by the uh, National Resources Governance Institute is also available publicly. And based on this score, Mongolia is ranking uh, preferably compared to a lot of countries. And of course, the situation and regulatory frameworks are still developing uh, because we are still young country and transitioned uh, in terms of, I think, democratic rule and market economy. But you can see what uh, we have done a lot of work improving the, the investment climate in Mongolia. And this government of Mongolia is also uh, aims to further attract more investment in the country and drive economic growth for prosperity of all people of Mongolia. So it's it from my side. And of course, if you will have any specific questions, I think uh, I will leave it to Q&A session. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful, Batang, and thank you. And thank you for sticking to time very well. That's terrific. Um, Jennifer, Ambassador Ivkov already mentioned the Merit Project. Uh, it, this is a big link between Canada and Mongolia, and it touches on the mining sector. So tell us a bit more. Hey, thank you very much, um, Dr. Dirks. Um, and thank you to the Canadian uh, Eurasia Chamber of Commerce for this opportunity to present the Merit Project. Um, so the Merit Project is the Mongolia Enhancing Resource Management Through Institutional Transformation. And it's a bilateral project funded by Global Affairs Canada and implemented by the Canadian Executive Service Organization. Um, and as, Catherine, as the Ambassador Ivkov mentioned, Merit is one of uh, Global Affairs Development Programs in Mongolia. So next slide, please. So Merit is an eight-year project. It's, it started in 2016 and will run till mid-2024. Um, by the end of, we're in our seventh year now, and by the end of year six, we had reached 15,000 public servants, of whom 9,000 were women and we reached 3,000 community members, of which 1,800 were women. Next slide. The project goal is to enhance public sector management of the extractive sector in order to maximize the contribution to sustainable economic and social development through responsible resource management. It's a very practical project and it's focused on capacity building um, through training and mentoring programs with public servants and community members. We have three key outcomes. Um, the first outcome is enhanced public sector management practices in the mining and petroleum sectors. So we work with a lot of the ministries and agencies at the central level um, to strengthen public sector practices. Um, in the second outcome, it's enhanced collaboration and relationship management both at the national and the local levels. And this is very important. We create space for dialogue between the central level ministries and agencies and local provincial and district and sub-district governments to discuss the mining sector and to reach um, solutions together. We do that through regional conferences. We do that through communities of practice. Um, and our third outcome, is to improve the access to gender sensitive training and knowledge sharing tools for educational institutions. So we work with universities um, and schools, both at the central and the local level. Um, academic institutions are well respected in Mongolia. So they're a good third party to have present to deliver training to the communities. We really rely on their, their expertise. In this slide, we'll talk about collaboration with the regulators. Um, as I mentioned, the partners include the central level ministries and agencies, 
and Merit works in four different provinces um, in the eastern and central region of Mongolia. Uh, we work with the provincial level governments, the district level governments, and the sub-district level governments. Um, we implement our annual work plans based on our partners' needs and priorities and housed under the, the current legislation and regulations. Um, so these are just some of the examples of the products that we've produced with the different partners. Um, everything that we do has a strong gender lens. So in terms of the mining policies and petroleum policies, we've worked with the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry to include a gender lens, both in the policy and its guidelines, as well as a results-based lens, so that the work can, the oversight of the work can be monitored and tracked efficiently. Um, in 2020, we did a participatory gender audit with the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry. Um, and with the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry and the Women's Minerals Association, um, we've co-hosted and supported them in the delivery of a Women in Mining Conference, which is an annual event, as well as um, a book, this book in the middle that you see, it's called The Wonderful 50. Um, wonderful 50 stories of inspirational women role models in mining. And that was launched in 2020 to highlight the role of women in um, the development of Mongolia's mining sector. And we've also, with the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, developed uh, training and field manuals on mine water resource um, oversight and reclamation and mine closure as well. Um, in 2021, we had a, a nice collaboration with the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry, the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, the Generalized Agency on Specialized Inspection to develop this uh, training on responsible mining and its legal environment in Mongolia. This collaborative effort provides um, information and guidance on updated environmental legislation for the local mine inspectors and for the um, environmental officers. And this training is scaled up, so it's offered throughout Mongolia to all 21 provinces. Next slide, please. So um, we've heard a lot about Mongolia in the previous um, presentations. Uh, here, I just wanna highlight that Mongolia is strengthening uh, the governance of the mining and the environmental sectors through updates and improvements to its laws and its regulations. Um, the mine closure plan, the regulation and the guidelines were approved in 2019. Uh, and mine closure planning is, is a really new concept for Mongolia. There's very limited knowledge and experience in both the private sector and the public sector, um, apart from the, the large international companies. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the key stakeholders, and now I'm gonna focus on the mine closure plan pilot, which we've been running since uh, September, 2021. Um, so the, in, two 20, in 2021, Merit partnered with Eardness Silver Resources, which is a state owned mining company, as well as the regulators, the Ministry of Mining and Heavy Industry and the Ministry of Environment and Tourism and their related agencies, local government and community members to develop a mine closure plan for the Salkik Silver Mine, which is located in the province of Dungobi, which is in the mid Gobi Desert region. Um, and these stakeholders are engaged, uh, very engaged in the process and provide meaningful contribution throughout. This is a very participatory process and their active participation is both building understanding, buy-in and commitment to the mine closure planning process in Mongolia. Um, one of the key, the lead um, organization in the mine closure plan pilot is our Canadian private sector partner, uh, CPP Environmental. And they were selected to provide both the strategic advisory and technical roles at both stages of the, the pilot. Uh, they bring a wide range of experience in mine closure planning from Canada, but what makes a difference is their deep commitment uh, and dedication 
to the capacity building component of this project. Uh, so next slide, please. So these are the stages of the mine closure pilot, but I wanna start, I wanna emphasize the focus on capacity building at all levels with the regulators, the company, the local government and the community members. The pilot works to improve their knowledge, skills, and provides tools for mine closure, strengthening the capacity of the stakeholders to meaningfully participate in the process. Um, so you can see here in stage one, it started in September, 2021, and it ran until April of 2022. And the key deliverables were a regulatory review, background information collection, a baseline environmental sampling, stakeholder engagement. There were seven different series of consultations that were held, which really sets precedent for stakeholder engagement in, um, in Mongolia. It was a very extensive process, which resulted in um, all the stakeholders unanimously, unanimously divide, deciding on the goals and objectives for land use planning after, after the, the closure. And then the final, the final deliverable is a risk identification and assessment. And now we're just beginning stage two of this mine closure plan pilot. In June, we've already launched um, the, the pilot with the local consultants. And this Friday, we'll launch it with the, the key stakeholders. Um, here, I just want to emphasize um, the significant scientific and engineering effort, as well as the financial commitment that are required to complete this stage. So we're working at this stage very closely with the Canadian consultants, as well as a whole team of local consultants. Um, and of course, the company who has the final ownership of this mine closure plan. And it, it will result in, in a living document for this company, Salkic Silver Mines. Okay, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so throughout the project, we have two overarching goals. And the first one is the mine closure plan. Uh, and as I just mentioned, the company at the end of this pilot will have a working document. Um, and then the key objectives under this, it has to be innovative, incorporating international best practice that's adapted to the Mongolian context where, where it makes sense. Always throughout the project, gender equality principles, a gender lens, and especially in the stakeholder engagement, ensuring that the right voices are being heard at the table and taken into account when we're developing the plan. Uh, it has to be realistic and economically achievable so that the company can actually pay for the closure that, that's been decided upon. Um, it's got to support the socioeconomic transition after the mine closure. It's got to look at the climate change um, through adaptation. And one of the local consultants that are hired on a team is a climate change specialist, because this, this region, all of Mongolia, but especially this region is very arid. Um, they're experiencing stronger windstorms, uh, stronger winters um, as a result of climate change. So that's very important in terms of the, the reclamation, the rehabilitation, and vegetation that's chosen for the mine closure process and supports the, the strengthening of the laws and regulations. It's going to inform through the process of applying the law on mine closure planning, um, highlight the gaps and, and uh, opportunities to strengthen that. Uh, next slide, please. So the second goal is to enhance knowledge and the competencies of planning team members, stakeholders, and local citizens. Again, back to the capacity building. We don't want to just develop a mine closure plan to give to the company. We want to develop the capacity of the key stakeholders, the regulators, the company, local government, communities, so that they can continue this process um, on their own. Um, and again, implement learning opportunities, fulfilling team members, stakeholder needs, improve the knowledge and again, using best practice and where possible, promote innovation through that adapting of the international best practice and engaging really, really in a meaningful way, the local citizens and herders and community representatives, ensuring that they're informed, ensuring that the women are at the table, um, ensuring that the whole team understands the different impacts of mine closure planning on 
women and men and girls and boys. Um, okay, so the next uh, slide, please. Jennifer, my apologies, but in, in the interest of time, can you sort of get to a conclusion of sorts? Yeah, certainly. So I'll Fantastic. quickly go through the benefits here, and, and I've outlined a lot of the benefits. Um, again, the updating of the, um, the, the gaps, identifying the gaps in the, in the laws and being able to give that information back to the government so that they can strengthen the laws. Um, the importance of, of promoting dialogue and collaboration between the regulators is really important. Next slide, please. Um, this, again, the mine closure plan will be a model for future mine closures in Mongolia for the different companies and for the regulators. And it's showcasing the, the capacity of the state-owned mine. The next slide, please. Uh, we talked about climate change and how important that is. Um, stakeholder engagement in the next slide. I've already mentioned the importance of that. And in the last slide, I just want to highlight how, how timely this pilot is in terms of supporting the Mongolian government. Um, Oyongo mentioned the, in her presentation how Mongolia is preparing to be a supplier in the green transition era. And she also mentioned the new revival policy. So this, this pilot will support uh, the legislation um, and identify how the sector and how Mongolia can support climate change initiatives. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over time. Jennifer, it's wonderful to learn about these projects and, and some of the impact that you're having. Um, Tatiana, I've been a horrible moderator. I've given you a terrible um, cost and time overrun, but I've been a great moderator because I had great panelists uh, and we learned a whole lot. So my apologies for the time overrun, but back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, actually, it, it was incredibly interesting presentations and uh, uh, the fact that we went uh, a little bit over time. I think uh, in, in this case, time may be not uh, the major component uh, of the whole thing. So uh, we are now moving forward and our next panel is uh, innovations, uh, ESG and sustainable development. Uh, the moderator here is the person who has made a really great input into this event, uh, helping to reach out to the government and business stakeholders and providing valuable guidance uh, on the conference content. I am introducing James Kim, a Consular Commercial at Canadian Embassy to Mongolia. James is the Trade Commissioner with over 15 years experience. Before posting in Mongolia, he has been working at Canadian Embassy at Rio de Janeiro and China. James graduated from the University of British Columbia and speaks four languages. Um, I would like to give you James Kim. James, the stage is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Tatiana. And uh, well, good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to be actually able to moderate this next session. Uh, we did, we, we heard a lot about mining in Mongolia, the potential opportunities. Mongolia has a lot of untapped natural resources, but I think this next um, the focus area is equally important as mining companies look to uh, do mining in uh, new jurisdictions, especially in Mongolia um, as well, is that the ESG component, the environment, social governance, and the sustainable development of uh, the mining sector is a uh, a topic that's actually um, not uh, nice to do anymore, but actually is a must to, must do. And we have a very good group, uh, I have to say, of uh, panelists that will help share the insights um, on this. Uh, we have uh, Nicole Lans uh, Lansted, who's the Deputy Director of the Responsible Business uh, Practice um, at Global Affairs Canada. And I believe she'll be speaking a little bit more about the, uh, the new uh, RBC uh, strategy uh, that's been uh, launched by the department. And because it is from the the government of Canada perspective, it is an expectation that we do want Canadian companies doing business abroad, mining companies that are mining abroad to act in a uh, responsible, sustainable, uh, and ethical uh, manner as well. And we also have uh, Professor Jocelyn Fraser with the Norman B. Keville Institute of Mining Engineering at uh, the University of British Columbia as well. Um, she focuses on social risk and social responsibility uh, in the mining sector. So it'll be very um, interesting to get her views on this. 
Uh, we also, I guess we cannot uh, exclude OT. They, um, it's one of the largest projects, but really the, I think the part that also needs to be highlighted uh, from the Oyu Togoi project as well is uh, the, the community engagement that they're also engaged in, in is that we hear that they are the largest um, investor in Mongolia, but uh, they do also do a lot of work on the CSR side and community engagement. Um, and it's one, I think it's one of the factors that is, that's making them very successful uh, in their operations in Mongolia as well. And lastly, um, <clears throat> We would we have uh, Sunjima Jamba, who's also the managing director at Biz Mongolia. Uh, they specialize in uh, ESG matters. Um, Sunjima is also the chair of uh, the uh, CSR and Sustainability Committee at the Mongolian National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So um, you know, I can't think of a better person that can speak on ESG matters in Mongolia as well. So first, uh, I'll turn it over to Nicole. Um, Nicole, could you maybe uh, well, share with us um, the new RBC strategy? And I'm not sure if you're gonna also talk, speak about the core as well, but um, I think we'd be interested to get your views there. So thanks. Uh, thanks so much, James. And um, uh, thank you to the Canadian Eurasia Chamber of Commerce for the invitation today, your excellencies, uh, fellow panelists and participants. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so as we, we start off, I would like <clears throat> as many of you to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the um, unceded and traditional territories of the Anishinaabe or the Algonquin Anishinaabe uh, people. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I actually did my master's thesis on responsible uh, mining in uh, Mongolia way back in 2007. So it's really exciting to see how, how things have changed um, and, and that there's so much excitement and, and collaboration and partnership with Canada in this space. So in my current role as Deputy Director of the Responsible Business Practices Division at Global Affairs Canada, I've been leading the development of our new Responsible Business Practices Strategy, uh, which I'll be speaking to you a bit about uh, today. So I just, I think, I think James and Ambassador Ifkov can speak much better than me about this, but I think the partnership between Canada and Mongolia is a, a really exciting collaboration. We have strong bilateral ties uh, as everyone here knows, Canada is an important investor in Mongolia, and the opportunities are, are, are quite profound. I know mining has built an incredible foundation of collaboration between our companies, our countries, but there's opportunities across clean technologies, education, agriculture, infrastructure, green building um, as well. So before I start talking about our new strategy, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the language that, that we use within the government of Canada with respect to responsible business conduct. Um, really, when we say responsible business conduct, we're looking at a holistic approach. It's really about integrating the management of risk, the environment, people, and society within the core of business operations. I think many of us use interchangeable terms. They all have different nuances, corporate social responsibility, um, environmental social governance. Uh, the government of Canada, for a large part, have adopted the, o uh, the OECD term of responsible business conduct. Um, and so I would just also note that responsible business conduct is really in integrated in Canada's um, engagement on the global um, um, uh, stage and apologies, it's late for me, so I'm uh, uh, searching for words a little bit. Um, so we we um, adhere to various guidelines, such as the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the OECD uh, guidelines for on multinational enterprises, amongst many many others. And we're increasingly seeing discussions about responsible business conduct throughout multilateral fora, such as at the G G7, uh, for example. So why is responsible business conduct important? Um, what we really see and where I sit within Global Affairs Canada, uh, similar to James, we're part of the Trade Commissioner Service. So our role is to promote Canadian companies um, um, active abroad to, to develop partnerships, to seek business opportunities. What we see is that when our Canadian businesses go abroad, um, a commitment and in integrating responsible business conduct throughout their operations can help them mitigate risks but it can also help their partners and their potential uh, collaborators mitigate risks as well. Uh, we saw through the pandemic that companies with a commitment to responsible business conduct were better able to manage their supply chains. They were able to take action and to adapt and be flexible to all of the, the challenges that the pandemic brought. Increasingly in Canada and around the world, we're seeing legal requirements related to responsible business conduct. For example, in Canada, we have the Extractive Se uh, Sectors Transparency Measures Act, 
We have the Corruption of Foreign Public Officials Act. Um, and now under um, the, the Canada-US-Mexico Free Trade Agreement, um, there is a ban on any products being made with forced labor from entering Canada. And you'll see in Parliament, there's increasing discussions around legislation uh, related to forced labor. Finally, um, responsible business conduct is at the nexus of so many of Canada's priorities. Uh, the respect for human rights, taking action on climate change, inclusive trade, upholding the rights of Indigenous people, and our feminist foreign policy. So turning a little bit to, to the new strategy, um, it was just launched on April uh, 28th uh, of this year. Um, and it, is, it, it has really transformed our previous approach in the sense that while well, previous strategies were focused entirely on the extractive sector, this new strategy is, uh, is inclusive of all industry sectors. Um, so, so as mentioned already, uh, recently released and applies to all industry sectors. Um, this is a big change for us. Uh, Canada's had a responsible business conduct strategy since 2009. It was updated in 2014. And this year, after extensive consultations with a range of stakeholders, uh, there was a decision made that this could apply to any Canadian company active abroad. Um, and by active abroad, I'm also referring to companies that may be importing products into Canada. One of the reasons for this change is that we're seeing the responsible business conduct um, landscape changing significantly. More and more issues are arising, for example, in the technology sector. Um, uh, technology infrastructure is not just unique to the mining sector. Um, and yes, I noted as well, public consultations in 2020 took place. Uh, this was with uh, stakeholders across Canada, but also international partners as well. Um, the new strategy also includes an action plan, and this lays out how we will deliver the strategy over the next five years. It includes different guidance products, tools uh, that I'll get into a little bit more further. So the new strategy is really built around three key components. The first is building awareness and championing action. This is really about Canada promoting responsible business conduct um, with our Canadian companies abroad, but also with our international partners. Uh, we are encouraging and expecting Canadian companies to ad adopt um, leading responsible business practices throughout every facet of their operations um, and um, work to share these best practices when they're abroad. The second component of the strategy is supporting the uptake of due diligence and accountability. Um, this is about increasing that uptake and accelerating the uptake of responsible business practices uh, within Canadian companies. Um, the new strategy actually introduces some new tools uh, that will see this happen. For example, uh, it is under development right now, all clients of the Trade Commissioner Service, and so the Trade Commissioner Service is the Government of Canada's Trade Department, will be asked to sign an attestation, uh, having them state that they are committed to responsible business conduct and that they take steps to integrate RBC throughout all of their operations. Um, for Canadian companies that don't follow leading responsible business practices or who uh, run into challenges abroad uh, for, for, for perhaps a fault of their own, um, we do have two dispute resolution mechanisms that are in place. We have the national contact point for the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. And this is a dispute resolution mechanism that applies to all sectors and a range of, of issues. It could be labor disputes, environmental, uh, human rights, and this can apply abroad or in Canada. We also have a second dispute resolution mechanism, and this one is quite uh, newer. It's the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise, which we call the CORE, uh, which you may have heard of. And um, Ms. Meyerhofer, who is the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise, was recently at PDAC. And the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise can review cases related to uh, human rights allegations um, abroad uh, in the mining, oil and gas, and garment sectors. Uh, but she also plays a very promotional uh, role where, where she can work with Canadian companies, she can work with um, partners abroad to integrate and provide RBC advice. The third component of the strategy is really about strengthening the global responsible business conduct ecosystem. And this is about working with partners on the international stage uh, to contribute to a rules-based international system that advances Canada's interests and values uh, integrates responsible business conduct in our bilateral and multilateral agreements and fostering that enabling environment uh, for our for responsible business practices to thrive. 
The strategy itself is supported by five enablers. This includes uh, stakeholder engagement. So I hope that this will not be the, the last time that I'm speaking with all of you today. Uh, we have an action plan, which details the, the guidance and the tools that we'll be rolling out and developing over the next five years. Uh, I would note that these tools will be looking to consult with as many stakeholders and partners as possible. Um, one uh, challenge that we all have uh, around the world, no matter where we sit, is uh, policy coherence across government departments. Uh, when we look within the Government of Canada, there's over 50 initiatives across our departments that touch on responsible business conduct. So a big part of this strategy is trying to work with our other government departments, such as the Natural Resources um, Canada. Um, we have Employment Social Development Canada, who works on labor, and making sure we're working together uh, to achieve uh, strong outcomes for Canada. Uh, measurement is always important, and I really appreciated Jennifer's presentation um, that really focused on that as well and the role that CISO plays um, in driving that, and then the new tools, which I've mentioned. So why does this matter for the Canada and Mongolia relationship? Um, for Canadian companies that are active in Mongolia, we want you to prioritize responsible business conduct, and we, we expect you to. Um, I feel a bit like the mom with the, the expect you to term, but, but it's really part of, of how we do business abroad and our values abroad. Uh, we expect you to integrate world-leading responsible business practices throughout all of your operations, and this contributes to Canada's brand in Mongolia and around the world. And we want to show the world that through our Canadian companies that responsible business conduct is a competitive advantage, and this is the way of doing business of the future. For our Mongolian partners, um, we want you to recognize that doing uh, business with Canada brings many benefits with respect to um, environment, social, and governance issues. We'd love to see you prioritize uh, responsible business conduct in your decision making, which is something that I think is already very much done in Mongolia. And we'd love to partner with you to establish sustainable partnerships for the future, uh, whether it be related to climate change, um, the sustainable development goals, and all of these complex global issues that we're all um, uh, struggling with. So uh, I'll, I'll keep my presentation short today, um, but just to say uh, we have a small team here at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, we're always available for questions or comments. And I, um, if you haven't seen the strategy, uh, you, can, you can find it on our Global Affairs website. If you have any questions, comments, uh, see an opportunity for collaboration, uh, please reach out to me. And James, I'm gonna I'm gonna volunteer you and as our a representative in Mongolia as well. And that if there's anything we can do to support you, uh, that's what we're here for. So thank you again for the opportunity, uh, and looking forward to the other presentations on this panel this evening. So th thank you again, Nicole, and uh, thanks for sharing sharing that. Um, and yes, you're right. You know, I think now. Responsible business conduct is really a must, and as we've heard, it's you know the companies do need to start building it into their plans. Um, you know, it's like ten minutes is very short, but I think to really get an understanding of the entire strategy. Um, but uh, you know, the one thing I think I would like to share is that yes, we are here. The uh, the Trade Commissioner Service in Mongolia also at Global Affairs, so we are here to help support uh, Canadian companies uh, with your RBC plans. As you you know, that's part of the service we offer for two Canadian companies is to help you with your RBC plan as well, uh, tailor it to the local market. So um, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Professor Jocelyn Fraser, uh, who's with the Norman, <clears throat> Norman B. Kevo Institute, um, uh, uh, Institute of Mining and Engineering at, at UBC. Uh, I think we're, it's a very, I think it's a nice uh, segue in, uh, as, uh, um, Nicole just spoke about the, uh, the new uh, responsible business conduct uh, strategy being developed by the government, uh, well, Global Affairs Canada in particular. Um, but I know Dr. Fraser is also focused on social risk and social responsibility in the mining sector, uh, with a particular interest in, in uh, investigating ways in which mining companies uh, can collaborate with communities to develop a strategy, a business strategy, uh, and, and really with uh, goals of improving operational performance um, while delivering tangible uh, social benefits uh, at the same time. Uh, and that's really in line with what we, I think we also are saying with the RBC strategy is that it does make financial sense as well. So uh, Dr. Fraser, I'd like to uh, pass it over to you um, for your insights. 
Great. Thank you very much, James. And good evening or good morning, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, like many of my fellow panelists, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional, ancestral and unceded lands of the Coast Salish people here in Vancouver, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about this idea about corporate social responsibility, where we are in the mining sector, why we're there and where we could go. Um, and before that, I'd like to acknowledge as many of my fellow panelists and speakers this afternoon have done the importance of the mining sector, um, not just in providing the metals, minerals and materials that the world wants and needs and buys, but also in providing economic development and employment opportunities in countries around the world. We've heard from a number of the other speakers about the importance of the mining sector in Mongolia and Canada's close uh, relationship with Mongolia as one of its principal foreign direct investors. Um, and yet, Despite the importance of the sector and the recognition of the critical role that we will play in our transition to a low carbon economy, um, there are concerns around the world, not just in Mongolia, but in every country where mining happens, about the industry's impact on the environment and society. And this has given rise to increasing interest in this idea about environment and social and governance, or ESG performance. Um, it's raised questions from an increasingly diverse group of people, including perhaps most recently investors and capital markets. Um, and so often Oftentimes we see companies embrace ideas of corporate social responsibility as a way to reduce the risk of community opposition to mining projects that are either proposed or already in operations. Um, so mining companies often institute these corporate social responsibility programs or initiatives. The concept of CSR is well established. And today there are a vast number of CSR initiatives um, that companies undertake. Um, however, um, there's ongoing debate about the effectiveness of many of these CSR programs. Um, many of them are anchored in philanthropic investment. And while that's important and necessary in many of the regions where mining operates, there's questions about how much that has really contributed to the long term sustainable development of resource rich regions around the world. Now, in addition to philanthropic investment, many companies adopt what we call in the CSR world doing well by doing good. Performance optimization initiatives that save companies money and also provide some sort of an environmental or social benefit. Initiatives like energy savings or reducing greenhouse gas emissions or adding renewable energy into the mix. So as I mentioned, these are often referred to as doing well by doing good. And these two approaches to corporate social responsibility are needed. However, I would suggest that mining can and should be a catalyst for the long-term sustainable development of the communities that host its operations. And for mining to do that, to function as a catalyst for sustainable development, I think we need to add a new category into the CSR mix. And that's the idea of creating shared value. This concept or terminology was introduced about a decade ago by two professors from Harvard. Um, and it's really to describe an approach whereby companies create measurable business value by identifying and addressing social problems that intersect with their needs. And so by adding this idea of shared value into the social responsibility framework, we would be creating a continuum that would see us moving from traditional approaches to philanthropic investment, combining those with ideas for performance optimization, and ultimately ending up with this idea of shared value to help us really deliver long-term sustainable development. This kind of approach to shared value does require collaborative partnerships. And I think there are some good examples. Um, we heard Bulgan talk a little bit about Erdine, so I'm gonna to touch on them in a minute, but I'll share a couple of examples with you from other regions of the world. Um, Cerro Verde, so this is a large project uh, in Peru, um, implemented a very interesting project, collaborate with water users to address what can be a trigger of conflict in many countries of the world 
competition for an increasingly scarce resource. Their collaboration with water users led to a decision to use treated municipal wastewater for their mining operations. This was a very innovative approach suggested to them by social groups. And so we see this strong collaborative partnership. Um, Anglo American is another company where we can find very many interesting examples of creating shared value. My first exposure to the idea of shared value came when I worked at De Beers uh, 20 years ago, and De Beers, of course, is now um, an Anglo American company. Again, very interesting work done in the water sector, which is an area that's of particular interest to me and my colleagues at UBC. I was also impressed by the work that Lundin Gold is doing in Ecuador around a relatively new mine there. And it's interesting because Lundin is not a large company like Freeport McMoran or Anglo American. They're a small single asset company. And yet the work that they did to support employees who wanted to open a catering business and then more significantly to help them develop a supply chain for that new business, which really then served to catalyze economic development in the region where the mine is located. For several years now, I've had the pleasure of doing a research project, a longitudinal case study, looking at the work that Erdine is doing in, with that Bayan Kundi gold discovery in the Southwest Gobi Desert. Um, really looking at the smaller steps that they've taken as a small company, still very dependent upon equity markets for cash to help build water stewardship initiatives in an area of the Gobi Desert where water is increasingly scarce. Sometimes companies wonder, well, where can we begin a conversation around creating shared value? And I think an excellent place to start to look is at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, because here we find many of the points of intersection between what companies need, mining companies need for their long term business success and what communities need for their sustainable development. Think about SDG number seven, affordable and clean energy. We both need it. We both want it. I hope that all of our stakeholders are aligned on the need for climate action. That's SDG 13. In many areas of the world, companies and communities both need infrastructure, SDG 9. And of course, I've already mentioned SDG 6, access to clean water and sanitation. Building the collaborative partnerships that are a key feature of the shared value concept can be a way to reduce tension um, that can arise between mining companies and communities. I mentioned these tensions can arise from competition for scarce resources, such as water, and in both developing and emerging economies, tension can arise between the pursuit of economic development to alleviate poverty versus the protection of cultural traditions. We see that happening in Canada with our Indigenous people, and I think we also see it in Mongolia, where efforts to expand the economy through the development of mineral resources have raised questions about how to accommodate the economic benefits of mining without compromising traditional ways of life. And this is another place where I think creating shared value can be a useful approach in terms of social responsibility and ESG. In Mongolia, for example, there's numerous points of intersection between what herders need and what mining companies need. Access to water, access to electricity, access to markets. And these can be explored on a case-by-case -case basis to see where companies and communities can collaborate to secure benefits for both. In addition to corporate social responsibility and creating shared value, there are two related concepts that I think are relevant to our conversation. The first is business models. And one of the questions I've been giving a lot of thought to in recent months is whether the business models of mining are fit for purpose in today's society. Society has changed immensely over the last 50 years, and business models for mining really haven't. So to accommodate the need to create shared value and deliver on ESG performance metrics, I think that business model change may be needed in the mining sector. And I'd also like to make the observation that ESG, um, it's wonderful to see the increasing interest in ESG in the mining sector. I've been an ESG practitioner for over 20 years, and it's sometimes been a pretty lonely journey. But please, let's remember that ESG, environment, social and governance, is not a substitute for corporate social responsibility. 
ESG is really a reporting mechanism that enables you to report upon your social responsibility. And ESG is also not the same as sustainability. Sustainability is the process or the journey that the social responsibility strategy will help you to deliver and that ESG reports upon. And as I close, I just wanted to take the opportunity to share four books with you um, that have really been very sort of influential for me over the last few years. These may not yet be available in Mongolian, um, but I did want to share them with you as I think some of you may find them as interesting as I have done. And if you'd like a sneak preview, Kate Rayworth, the author of Donut Economics, has a 20 minute TED talk, um, which gives you a nice insight into the work that she's doing. Mariana Mazakudo is an economist who's looking at this idea about how we can move towards more collaborative approaches to capitalism. John Elkington, the father of the triple bottom line, has this wonderful new book out on green swans, which has all kinds of super interesting case stories and um, things to share with us. And then Net Positive, a wonderful read on um, an optimistic look for the future. So with that, let me say thank you very much for your time, Bayetla, and I look forward to the other panelists' presentations and our question and answer session. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Fraser, for that. And yes, I do completely agree. Uh, this concept of creating shared value is something that uh, we all do really need to take to heart. And I um, hope this is a key message that uh, I guess a lot of the mining companies when looking at uh, mining in Mongolia uh, do take to heart. Um, and next, I'd like to introduce um, Najma, who is the leader of the OT communities and CSR team at Oitoko. And now, when we talk about mining in Mongolia, it's really impossible not to talk about or hear about OT, Oitoko. Um, uh, but today, we'd like to focus a little bit more on really how o uh, OT has um, is really trying to create this shared value with the community that they're um, they're mining in. So, with that, uh, Najima, maybe you can uh, share with us uh, just very briefly uh, how OT is uh, really creating this shared value in uh, in your communities. Thank you all very much for inviting us to share our experiences in this important platform, and um, I'll go through mostly uh, around. Uh, uh, OT experiences in the communities area, uh, community engagement and partnerships. Can you see my screen? Yes, now we can. Good. Um, sorry, this is a very busy and a lot of tables and a lot of text in this uh, framework that uh, we just wanted to show you that what we do when it comes to the community uh, engagement in the communities area at OT. So um, as a uh, the big mine operating in the Gobi region, we are required to comply with many other international standards uh, as um, we are implementing Rio Tinto management system in uh, OT. We need to comply with Rio Tinto standards as well as the many other lenders. As the ambassador mentioned, uh, we uh, received uh, quite amount of uh, uh, funding for our underground development. So um, naturally we are required to uh, comply with all the requirements they set on us and environmental and social areas. So we do uh, comply with all those uh, important standards. So when it comes to communities area, we wanted to make sure we create these, um, uh, we wanted to earn this uh, license from our community, not only uh, on the legal licenses, but in the social license to operate in our communities, because we are there for uh, generations um, of our community. So uh, we started with our work with the knowledge base. Uh, we conducted our very first uh, social economic baseline study back in 2008 and then updated regularly. The last one was done in 2018, uh, comparing, being able to compare the changes in our community uh, on a 10 year basis. And obviously we do a lot of um, different levels of, of environmental social impact assessments. And based on that, we also developed the operational management plans under the social area, for example, we have six, seven uh, operational management plans addressing stakeholder engagement, resettlement, compensation to herders, pasture land management, and livelihood, participatory and environmental monitoring, community health, safety and security, cultural heritage management, in migration, etc. So all these are uh, to uh, understand and mitigate our impact, potential impact to our community. And then we also move 
beyond that uh, impact mitigation approach, we also try to establish a long-term sustainable development partnership in our local community. So uh, in the green box, you see uh, joint mechanisms we established. Uh, we uh, established a cooperation agreement or a community agreement with our, our host community as being a strategic project of protecting an agave. We are required to have agreement uh, with our uh, AMEC or provincial level, as well as the, our direct host community at the SUM level as well. And uh, under that cooperation agreement, we have a relationship committee, a joint committee with the local uh, participation and the company, as well as we have the joint working groups on local procurement and local improve, uh, employment. Also, we established this Gobi IO Development Support Fund to deliver our commitment under the cooperation agreement to the community. I will discuss it a bit later uh, with more details. And also, we do have this uh, council named its engagement platform, uh, Tripartite Council in Hamburg, uh, which started from a uh, local community complaint to the CAO IFC Ombudsman's office. And we, over the years um, of engagement and partnership, we moved into a more um, partnership approach and engagement platform on there. So Sorry, these uh, slides- Najma, are, is your slide supposed to be moving because it's, you're still stuck on the no. first slide? Sorry, I'm moving to the next slide now. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> So all these compliances and the partnership uh, initiatives we have on our plate, uh, we try to categorize them how um, uh, they are interconnected and how they are integrated with the overall business model and strategies. And, uh, and the most importantly, how we are contributing in the longer term sustainable development in our community. So we try to see how in each area of our provisional management plans are actually contributing to the sustainable development goals. Um, so we categorize them. And also according to our uh, reporting system on a quarterly basis, we also see how uh, our work and our investment and partnership is contributing to this ASD development through the socioeconomic workbook uh, in a centralized way in Rio Tinto as well as for OT level. So um, all these investment agreement commitments and as well as the cooperation agreement commitment and also the operational management plans, they all all integrated and all direct, targeting to the uh, future de development of the community. So uh, the next slide is about this cooperation agreement we established with our local community back in 2015. The process took over uh, four years of negotiation and then uh, we landed on an agreement um, that uh, uh, is equal to our mining license, which is currently uh, 2033 and extendable. And we agreed on uh, seven thematic areas to partner with water management, environment management, which includes rehab, biodiversity, ecological balance, and uh, traditional animal husbandry in the pasture land management, history and culture and uh, social basic services, which includes uh, health and education and local business development and social, uh, social infrastructure. So uh, these are the main thematic areas. We partner with our communities under the cooperation agreement in order to implement all these uh, commitment under the cooperation agreement, we established this uh, GoBioYo Development Support Fund, uh, which is a, an NGO at the moment. We don't have a trust fund uh, legislation in Mongolia. So we are using the NGO law in Mongolia. Through the GoBioYo Development Support Fund, OT is committed to provide uh, 5 million US dollar investment every year to, uh, to the various development initiatives in uh, South Gobi, Women Gobi. And over the years, we've been able to uh, provide many important uh, social service and infrastructure, basic infrastructure projects, as well as the sustainable development programs. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there was a uh, demand from the local community side to establish more schools, kindergartens, health centers in the rural areas. But now we are moving eventually to the more long-term sustainable development programs, uh, which also includes integrated health program, which we are partnering with the UN, uh, UN um, Population Fund. And also we starting integrated education program this year with the uh, UNICEF and other UN agencies and other partners. So uh, with the development of uh, Gabi Ayo Development Support Fund, we also leveraging and attracting other um, development agencies and all other uh, investment opportunities to the South Gabi as well. 
So quite happy with the, the current structure, but we not only stuck there, uh, we also conducted um, uh, independent third party review, how we are doing and implementing the two, uh, cooperation agreement. And uh, we just received the report and parties are now uh, working on how we improve uh, and uh, move uh, forward with the cooperation agreement and its deliveries. So in other partnership uh, opportunities and the engagement of, uh, platforms we have is uh, Tripartite Council I mentioned. Uh, it's a engagement mechanism at the moment, but it started out as a complaint from local community. Uh, there was a two set of complaints back in 2012 and 13 uh, through the process of uh, CAA Ombudsman's office, uh, the parties decided to establish uh, this tripartite council because the issues we are trying to address was not only between the herders and the company, but it definitely required uh, involvement, active involvement of uh, local authorities. So uh, we established this uh, council back in 2015. Uh, representatives of uh, Hamburg Zum. Hamburg Zum is this small uh, host community of ours. Uh, the local government representative, the local herders representative, especially as uh, elected from each bug, the smallest administrative units uh, by the herders themselves and the company. So we sit together almost on a monthly basis and discuss the issues around uh, herder and pasture land water and uh, any other initiatives uh, issues related on that and try to find a solution rather than focusing on the problem and move together and um, there are two sets of uh, agreements under this uh, structure uh, which we call uh, herders complaint resolution agreement uh, and uh, we are actively uh, check and track how we implementing that agreement but the mindset behind this rather than focusing on the individual problems, let's focus on the more long-term communal benefits uh, when the mine and the nomadic way of herding is coexisting in this community, in this area. So um, we are also happy to discuss and find more content if needed. Uh, the Tripartite Council have its own Facebook and uh, also they recently opened the website. We do have independent secretariat helping uh, the platform to run. So this is a new way of new mechanism we're trying. So next two slides are more about these um, impact mitigation. What kind of social uh, operational management plans we have in order to mitigate our impact in local community. Uh, these are our commitment to the, our lenders and uh, accordingly we receive uh, two or three uh, times a, a year a independent audit by the lenders and check if we are uh, fulfilling our commitments under these uh, standards. So it would include the stakeholder engagement, resettlement and compensation, and um, community health and safety uh, programs. Because of the timing, I probably don't need to all of this read, uh, read all the activities under each operation management plans. But these are the plans we also update on a regular basis, on a two year basis. and. Um, Starting uh, from uh, last year, we also trying to include uh, the community participation, stakeholders participation in the uh, planning process and uh, re re reviewing, re updating the plans, and as well as the um, monitoring process. So uh, these are the areas we uh, work with our communities under the operation management plans. Um, the very uh, last update from the community side is uh, the Hamburg Zone Development Strategy. Uh, the parties have been discussing about this issue so many years, and now we, uh, the company is committed to provide initial 15 million investment into Hamburg Zone Center Development. Uh, we helped the, uh, the Zone to update its master plan accordingly. Uh, with the support of the government, uh, actively involved in the process, we are now moving into the more um, uh, development oriented partnership here, uh, hoping to create a, this um, beautiful modern small town in Agabi uh, and OT should be playing as a catalyzer of that uh, small town. So this is a new at the but very big initiative happening uh, at OT as well. Uh, this one slide, uh, uh, I also would like to cover uh, the very good uh, initiative of our cooperation agreement, uh, no, external affairs team also manage at the national level. Uh, many of you probably heard about this uh, uh, traffic police partnership we have for years now, which uh, uh, 
targeted to increase the awareness on the um, traffic safety, uh, road safety issues, which directly influenced to the, uh, the fatalities and incidents on the road. And uh, we are moving into the third stage on this initiative this year, focusing on the school areas in Sum, uh, at the uh, UB uh, of Ambatar town. So uh, this one is uh, moving forward quite well. It's not about the, how much money the company spends on such initiatives. Uh, as uh, uh, previous speaker mentioned that rather than being a more philanthropic way, be a development partner, uh, be the partnership. So in order to share our uh, culture and the importance of the safety, we started this national level campaign on the road safety and it went quite well. The, another project we also started a, a couple of years ago was um, targeting the gear area school uh, in Ulaanbaatar area. And also uh, the, uh, when we, uh, in order to enter uh, such intervention, we provide uh, risk assessments with the uh, SMEs in the area. And then we identified the very critical issues in that uh, uh, group, uh, target group was the mental issue of the young people, especially during the COVID period. And we are partnering with the um, uh, national NGOs, uh, establishing a consulting cabinets and training trainees and uh, physical, uh, psychological counseling to the um, uh, teenagers in the Gear District area. So this project is also, program is moving in its second year and we are hoping to expand that uh, initiative uh, uh, further and beyond. Uh, we try to focus on the specific issues rather than jumping into the random small issues and be a more sustainable strategy partner on such uh, issues. So uh, these are my uh, slides. And uh, if there is anything to clarify and ask, I'm happy to respond. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Nani. I'm not sure if we just had a technical problem, but um, I guess we were kind of only stuck on the first slide, so uh, we, we were not able oh. to kind of see most of your slides. But um, I um, guess I, I understand that your slides will be um, available as well. Um, so uh, we invite people to um, look through it uh, more carefully then. Uh, but thank you again for sharing some of the, the projects that OT is working on. Really, um, you did highlight very well, I guess, the, the important of working with the community and really the importance of you know being a partner uh, and working together rather than working against each other as well to make things work. Uh, I guess lastly, I guess I know we're going over time a little bit, um, but I'd like to introduce Sunjima, who's the managing director at Liz Magolia. Um, uh, she's also the chair of the CSR and Sustainable Committee, uh, Committee of the Mongolian Na National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, so, uh, Sinjima, I'd like to pass it over to you to share uh, some words and some insight um, and your perspective on ESG and CSR in Mongolia. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, James, and uh, good morning to UB and good evening to Canada. So, thank you for the opportunity. We Mongolians say that uh, the last camel carries the uh, the heavy uh, freight. So, but I think uh, uh, because most of the previous speaker has spoken all the key highlights. So I have two ones which have to. Uh, please next slide. I really would like to uh, focus on how uh, uh, how we can leverage ESG for the investing and doing business in Mongolia. I will uh, uh, share a few key uh, issues. And then the last uh, slide, I have prepared uh, some of the tips for the leveraging ESG in, in your investing and doing business in Mongolia. Next slide. So uh, I think it's not uh, quite uh, 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 straightforward. Uh, this slide really, uh, I just want to show why ESG, because uh, uh, the Dr. Uh, uh, Fraser also uh, mentioned that ESG actually it's not new thing, but the ESG is becoming very, very important. If you see this uh, uh, two uh, 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 recent, uh, the third, uh, the key risks for the mining. And 
Uh, today we are in two, uh, 2022, so I think there's risks, if not the, the toughest one, but still the one of the, the uh, risks in the industry. The second one is that because of the COVID and after the COVID, ESG is really the important factor for the making investors' decision. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So uh, here I want to touch uh, two points. The one is uh, we all know what's the ESG. This is environment, social governance. Again, back to the previous slide. ESG is not new thing, but I think it's important that ESG is becoming so important. It's a, a, a you know, demand of the, all the broader stakeholders and investors, especially because of the pandemic and especially because of the economic situation now in climate change and so on. So I would uh, just highlight on the ESG that environment, social governance, this is something from the company point of view, it's something uh, they're very important that uh, we are engaging and also uh, this is a linking with the uh, the external environment. So the second point here in the slide that what is the really what 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 the ESG issues are very really matters in Mongolia, and I want to touch at, uh, uh, three things uh, in the environment. Water is really the uh, important issue. This is really uh, uh, you know the interest of the communities, especially because of our culture, the Mongols uh, respect the water, but at the same time, the water scarce, uh, scarcity. The, on the social side, uh, the trusted partnership and engagement is very, very important. I would say it's more genuine engagement because like and certain admit, and Fred, Dr. Fraser also uh, mentioned that, you know, CSR or any engagement, it's not about uh, money or it's not about sponsorship. It's really about partnership. It's really about genuine engagement. On the governance side, I would like to charge uh, touch base on the uh, transparency and disclosure and uh, reporting. And this is very important, but at the same time, the business culture, business ethics is uh, uh, it's, uh, important. And this is the very much demanding and very much interest of the all the stakeholders in Mongolia. Next slide. So um, my uh, really the point of this presentation is that also, uh, uh, could you go to the previous slide? I think one more, just jump to the next slide. Uh, ESG could create value. That's the very important how we can uh, start to leveraging ESG to the, uh, to, for the investment and uh, doing business. Can you go to the, the next slide? I think the slides is jumping. And ESG could create values uh, 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 in those five areas and uh, top line growth and cost reductions and regulatory and legal interventions and productivity uplift and investment asset optimization. If any company has very strong ESG propositions, it's really uh, enables a strong uh, positioning in the society. It's also a uh, positioning very good in the government relationship and it, it, it could also uh, attract uh, the talent uh, so that the, the company could have a more productivity. Next slide. And if ESG could create, strong ESG could create uh, 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 the values. And I think uh, uh, it's uh, the question is that what kind of the ecosystem could leverage ESG? Um, so here, uh, the, the first one is really about the quick uh, overview of the stakeholders map in Mongolia, or it could be also any other countries. 
So the first important stakeholder is all about authorities in all the levels who is making policy and decision makers and who is also who are the regulators. The second one is really about those stakeholders who are affected directly and indirectly by the uh, investment and mining operations. And the third one is the more, much more broader one who are interested uh, in, a, in a mining operation. These are the, uh, these are the could be bigger one, all the public and the societies and business association, depending on the scale of the business and the, the mining project. So important thing that once we have the stakeholders mapping and we are just also uh, uh, from the leveraging ESG, the question comes, what are the shared interests? And uh, also the speaker was talking about shared values. So shared interest is really about, you know, profitable, sustainable business based on the strong ESG. If you go with this uh, from the shared interest, then it comes to also, then what are the high level issue, issues to connect those all the stakeholders. It's again environment restoration and also prosperity of the communities and the region and the nation in a country level and good governance practice. On the, the other point in this slide, I really uh, want to share that there are uh, the good opportunities for leveraging ASG in Mongolia. The timing is right because the price of the commodities is uh, uh, historically high. And um, during the pandemic and post pandemic, the, the mining companies have really uh, played important role for the economy. So this is also, also the uh, pandemic and uh, post pandemic uh, an opportunity uh, for the public to understand what are the, uh, the, the, the important role of the industry is doing. And this is also a great opportunity. And uh, the government policy and also progress made in OT project. And also this, these are the very good opportunity to leverage ASG. The last uh, two uh, opportunities I want to highlight is here is that because uh, ESG covers everything what the broader stakeholders want to see. It's more, uh, uh, it could be risky and also demanding, but it's also, uh, it's a great platform because this is the, what the broader stakeholder wants. The, uh, in the, because ESG beca has become very important and uh, uh, the major company, uh, the bigger companies made uh, the uh, commitments for the around ESG the excitement around ASG has become also increased. But in Mongolia, it's still what is ASG and how to uh, manage this ASG. And this is still uh, quite uh, new in terms of the understanding. So which gives also the opportunity if you, if you are more effective, if you are more uh, ahead of this ASG implementation. The next slide. This slide is really would like to show that, you know, because ESG is a broader issue and it's very important that uh, the, uh, we see the priorities for the alignment. So alignment like uh, 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 it's uh, from the international point of view, SDGs, where the Mongolia is doing in terms of the SDG and where could to partner and where could to support and where uh, could uh, kind of the provide some intervention. On the right hand, it's also, you know, what's the a vision for Mongolia? So Mongolian government has vision 2050, and also it's now the, uh, the because uh, the political cycle, parliament cycle is four years, the government action plan is from 2020, 2024. So it's very important to know what's the vision 2050 and what's the government action so that for the alignment for the priorities. Next slide. Uh, next slide. This will be my last slide. So uh, based on what I just really uh, high level and quickly share it. And here uh, I have provided a few some uh, tips for how to leverage ESG in your investing and doing business in Mongolia. And um, I think ESG, again, it shouldn't be a standalone. It should be integrated within your operation and within your governance and how you do engage, how you uh, build partnership. And uh, 
uh, I think it's very important that you use, you use ESG as a concept, as a framework for the positioning. If you do well ESG, like I said in a in previous position, that it will be really strengthening in creating value in, in how you, uh, in, in all these uh, operations and investment, and also uh, in, in the positioning uh, the area. And uh, uh, I think I just want to have maybe here two another point to make is that uh, because it's very important uh, for the company, for investor to develop and identify clear purpose of your business because your business is not just only, the result of the business is not just numbers. It's not just uh, what we do, uh, it's uh, in, a, in a balance sheet on KPIs. It's, it is much more bigger. So this is how it comes, shared interest and shared value. And this is very important. And uh, anything we do or you do on the in, uh, ESG, it's very important you also link with your engagement and also you do in participatory process. And it's also important that you are transparent and to communicate well. And anything what you have to, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, I think that one of the important points is that you build a very effective team uh, within the company. This is multidisciplinary and cross-functional, especially in Mongolia. It's for the community and like OTC Nedmet presented. It's very important to have the local team, but also it's good to have also the expats knowledge from the international uh, best practice. So I, I think I'll stop here and thank you for this opportunity. Okay, thank you for that, Sunjima. Um, and I think what we've been hearing is that, yes, a very common theme is that ESG uh, really does need to be fully integrated into, I guess, your, your business plan, I guess, when looking at um, looking at potential opportunities to do business in Mongolia. Um, with that, I, um, you know, I'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists uh, for sharing your insights. Um, I think this is a, it's an area I know in the past that probably did not get much attention, uh, but ESG, CSR, responsible business, I think these are really I think have become equally as important um, for companies that are looking to um, engage in mining operations uh, in, in foreign countries as well. And it's also the expectation. We do expect Canadian companies to uh, act responsibly uh, and we want them to, we want Canadian companies to be a role model as well. So uh, I know we've been, um, you know, uh, and Tatiana, um, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, I think I've been, e I've been <laughs> equally been um, uh, a bad moderator in terms of uh, times, but I didn't, you know, I think just given the importance of the topic, <laughs> I didn't want to, I wanted to try to give as much time to people. Um, but uh, thanks, thank you again, everyone. Uh, I, I found that really fascinating. Um, so back over to you, Tatiana. Thank you, James. And uh, now we are coming to the uh, Q&A. Uh, Dr. Dirks, uh, it's in your capable hands now. All right, excellent. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, I think at UBC, I would be fired if I ran a class for two and a half hours without a without at least a bathroom break. So if anyone needs to turn their camera off and disappear for a moment, uh, you have my full permission and encouragement to do so. But I'm really happy to see uh, so many of our panelists still, still here. Um, Uyanga and uh, Bigun, there were early questions in the Q&A that came directly to you. And I wanted, if you'd have a thought, a um, uh, chance to respond to those, let me just um, revisit them real brief from the Q&A. Uh, Murad Urkov had asked you, uh, Uyanga, about uh, magnetotelluric projects in, uh, in Mongolia. Um, are those happening? And maybe you know what those are, because I don't. Uyanga, any thoughts on that? Maybe she's taken my my admonishment to, to take a bio break <laughs> too seriously and stepped away for a moment. Bigo, and the other question was to you, um, right from uh, Tolman in the Q and A. If you saw that, um, is there any work being carried out to target for a copper periphery? Yes, sir. No, no immediate plans to uh, target the deeper copper potential right now. Um, just because uh, you know the the near surface exploration targets are much more easier and and lesser less riskier ones and you know whenever you're, you're finding gold closer to the surface you you want to continue that uh, kind of exhaust that opportunity and after that maybe go down to a much more 
super opportunities. That's the plan. Excellent. Thanks for responding to that. Um, audience members, by all means, uh, continue to avail yourself of the Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, um, feel free to post them in there. Hopefully that, that capacity is, is open to everyone and you can see where it is. Um, in the meantime, while we wait for more questions, I've got to ask sort of about the elephant in the room. Uh, Mongolia's northern neighbor is waging an aggressive war in Europe. Uh, Mongolia's southern neighbor, um, well, is China. Um, what does all this mean for the opportunities for the mining economy? And if any of you want to take that on, it's, it, there's no easy answer by any stretch, but any implications in the specific areas that you're focused on for any of you panelists? Nicole, you're dealing in global affairs. You must have answers to these things that you're probably not allowed to say publicly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll stick to our responsible business practices strategy, but I would I would love to to hear answers on this because I think geographically Mongolia is in such a fascinating position. Yeah, anyone want to take that on? Bigun, you're in you're in Ulaanbaatar. You mentioned. Uh, yes. Tell us a little bit of what sort of the perception in the in the local mining community of these geopolitical developments is and, and what that implies for the future. Yeah, it's, it's quite surprising how many um, international investors that invest into us, uh, invest into you know, MMC or other mining uh, companies that are listed internationally. And not many people really understand the kind of relationship that happens because as soon as this um, this uh, kind of situation is developed between Russia and Ukraine. So many people are just saying like, well, is Mongolia at risk for any you know, military uh, confrontation? So obviously, you know, that's not, that's not what we're experiencing. What we're really experiencing now is this logistical issues uh, in, the, in the country. And you know, the, the, the war in Ukraine is, I guess, um, you know, from, from a raw materials, uh, security point of view, for example, ammonium nitrate, which is very useful for the mining industry's explosive needs, um, and then the, the security of the fuel coming out of Russia, and then you know many products that's coming, uh, being shipped through Russia is you know starting to become difficult in, in the country. Number one, and number two, the the logistical issue on the southern border, I'd say, is you know much more uh, you know pressing issue compared to um, compared to what's happening on in, in Ukraine right now. Uh, I mean, at least from a Mongolian mining company's perspective. Yeah, Go ahead, James. My view there too is that, yeah, no, uh, Bill Gun's absolutely right, but I think it's not just the mining sector. Actually, when China closes its border, it has a very big impact on the Mongolian economy as a whole. Uh, as we know, Mongolia exports uh, close to or over 80% of what it produces, and out of what Mongolia produces about 90% is actually in the minerals and it's elbows to China. So, and um, from a mining perspective, uh, yes, uh, you know, I can say that China, it, Mongolia is very economically dependent on China and most of what is produced does go to China as well. So, um, and with the COVID pandemic, um, you know, we are hearing that uh, the border closures are having a very significant impact uh, across all sectors, actually. It's kind of one, I think it's one of the top things I hear from companies that it's when I ask them, you know, what's the biggest challenge you face? And you know, I think nine out of 10, or maybe even 10 out of 10 companies say it's the border. Um, they just can't get stuff in or out. Um, and going through Russia with the war, it just makes it much more complicated. Uh, companies that have to fly in now, uh, obviously the cost is going to be much higher. So yes, the, the border closure, it's having a very significant impact um, on Mongolia. You work with communities who are right in the border region to China. Is, is this a concern for community actors? Do they look at geopolitics or is that just too big a context on the, on the local level to be concerned about? Yes, uh, where we operate in the South Kabi uh, is the uh, has uh, has the border points that uh, such a critical and uh, important um, uh, channel when it comes to the uh, mining income to the country. So uh, the local authorities and local communities are well aware about the issue and uh, they always support the business initiatives when it ever comes to the logistical issue. And um, they also try to use their connections with the inner Mongolian government side as well and supports the, um, the business activities out there. 
uh, by now, it uh, seems like uh, local authorities and uh, Gobi herders, they also understand uh, how important is it we need to be uh, operating these border points uh, safe and sound uh, to make sure the whole country survives, especially during the COVID restrictions uh, where the JSK, the Russian water point was closed, uh, both the community and the local authorities uh, were very much supportive of um, the business initiatives, initiatives uh, to run the business smoothly. Mm -hmm. That's really great to hear sort of a local perspective on that. Nicole, you get a reward for keeping your camera on and staying late, uh, even though it's even later for you back east. Um, you heard Sanat meets a presentation mm -hmm. and, and her particular role at OT is obviously focused on that, uh, the community relations piece. Mm -hmm. what, what role does that play in the responsible business conduct? Yeah, I think, I think it's really about Canadian companies realizing the importance and how critical that is to, to engaging in Mongolia or, or any, any market. I mean, without that social um, license to operate, without that engagement, you know, I would say it's very difficult to but at the heart of it all is this notion about engagement, you know, working closely with the people who mining very much impacts. Um, and, you know, lots of times communities don't really have that much of a say in whether a mine development comes to their community or not. So I really feel that it, it behooves us <laughs> as an industry to explore these opportunities for mining to be a catalyst and to help communities achieve their goals for their own sustainable development. And Jennifer, you see all that. I mean, that's what the Merit Project is, is mostly about mm -hmm. in any case, to create that connection, right? Yes, yes. Um, and we're working, we're working really hard with the Mongolian government, um, especially as o Oyunga mentioned, uh, with the new revival policy um, to open, create the opportunities. Um, and we're working with a state-owned company right now. Uh, and that's really important because the opportunities for state-owned companies to be um, uh, partially privatized, um, they'll need to have the, these international standards and in, in closures. Um, so the whole, the whole package is working very well. Um, and in terms of the community engagement, that's so important. That we're working so closely with the communities to make sure that they understand the processes and their role and their opportunities to speak up. Um, and oftentimes it's just access to information. They're just, they're just really lacking that access to information. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a, an openness and a willingness amongst the companies and the government here to really work together to to figure out the, the ESR, the CSR, ESG, the CSR, and, and move forward together uh, and, and mm -hmm. take advantage of the opportunities in the global markets. Great. Um, Batsenga, you have sort of the, the most comprehensive across the private sector industry perspective um, in, in your role. Can you say a little bit about, um, I mean, Jocelyn has, has sort of traced how we've gone from CSR as terminology to, to ESG as a slightly different perspective. Jennifer was just referring to that as well. What's been the impact of these kind of movements? Um, or of course, also what Nicole talked about in terms of the Canadian government's version of responsible business conduct. What's the impact of these kind of movements on the private sector in Mongolia? Yeah, I think uh, from beginning, uh, in our company perspective, uh, We've been doing a lot of activities in terms of engaging community from beginning. So even before starting our project, we went to the, uh, the respective uh, Zoom and we've been talking to people, explaining what is our intention to do and so on. And uh, I think this uh, openness helped us to get uh, big support. And also, obviously, the concept of shared value uh, was introduced from beginning. So we've been very supportive of uh, local uh, the uh, residents employment. So as of today, I believe around 40% of our uh, employees are local residents. So effectively, we are on, on one of the largest employers in the region. At the same time, obviously, we always intended to uh, avoid this separation between us and them, right? So we try to get be part of the community from the beginning. And as such, for example, we invested in the local infrastructure, social infrastructure as well, building the housing projects, building the, building the school kindergarten. And although the initial intention of the company was provide these opportunities 
for education of kids and uh, medical services to our employees, but we left it open also to local community, other residents, right? So effectively our investments, uh, I believe brought a lot of uh, improvements in social uh, situation in the local Sumaria. And uh, for example, also a lot of investments been done by company in the infrastructure like water supply and power supply. Once we started our project in 2008, local Sum was actually without electricity. They had only one diesel generator, which was operating between uh, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. It was, right? Uh, but we built the power supply, power plant, and this provided at subsidized rates. Uh, obviously, it's regulated. It, uh, it provides also opportunity to grow business and, of course, improve the living standards. Same was drinking water. And obviously, we built the water uh, uh, supply facilities for our company. But at the same time, we are sharing the, 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 these facilities or the water, potable water, meeting the international uh, uh, World Health Organization standards with local community as well, right? So it comes with certain economic burden to the company, but we understand this is the part of our engagement and anyway, this investment's been made. So we believe it also should be shared with local community. So I think thanks to these all initiatives, uh, we got quite strong support. And I think uh, this has also been very vital in getting our projects executed on time and successfully. And uh, I think uh, we also shared this our experience with many mining companies who want to start operations in Mongolia or start mining operations. And we welcome them to our site, share our experience. One of the experiences also we have, we always try to avoid resolving personal issues. We always try to implement programs which bring the uh, benefits to uh, more people, stakeholders, right? So for example, we adopted the ISIMI support uh, fund. The financing, funding, initial funding is provided by company, but it goes through the local uh, bank branch. So it goes all criteria which required for the person to get the business loan but the funding source is provided by company. So, and plus we subsidize the interest rate in order to cover the uh, uh, charges in order to cover the bank expenses because they administer the loan, right? So it keeps the things within the uh, real standards as according to business requirement, but uh, it's a zero interest rate end of day for the local businesses. So I think this program was very successful. So I think, uh, uh, these type of initiatives, I think, uh, been always part of our company strategy. And with this uh, last year's development, uh, more focus on ESG side, uh, honestly, I believe it just helps us to formalize the policies, which been already previously adopted by our company and many other companies in Mongolia. One thing I would also like to stress out is Mongolia, we have very... Uh, young population and also it's only 3 million uh, people, right? So we have uh, uh, very limited uh, human resources. So effectively our, our intention from beginning was to focus on Western standard mining, right? So we cannot do mining by employing millions of people or something like this, like in China or Indonesia, right? So focus on efficiency and uh, productivity uh, will be always the, the main focus, I believe, in Mongolian mining industry. And as such, it was also, I believe, how projects like OT or our projects have been successfully implementing and uh, the Western technologies from Australia, Canada, and other countries. And I think it's also in terms of environmental management issues comes with this. And end of the efficient technologies, more productivity results in lower carbon emissions, lower consumption of resources as well in terms of productivity. It's not only productivity in terms of cost, but it's also productivity in terms of impact on the environment and our environmental footprint. So these aspects in Mongolia. And just to 
jump a little bit to side, uh, coming back to the question about location of Mongolia and recent geopolitical and pandemic situation. I think in mining industry, I think it was already mentioned earlier, uh, supply chain is very important. And I think uh, more mining companies, but also government of Mongolia now will probably start looking how they bring the supply chain uh, manufacturing to Mongolia, because it's of course mining activities in Mongolia conducted. So coal is being mined, copper is being mined, gold is being mined, but all consumables and spares and everything is imported. So effectively today, as a company executive perspective, if previously what question when we were talking with contractors or suppliers, if the question was, what is the price? What is the cost? Now the question is, do you have it? Where is lead time? What is lead time? And price is becoming really secondary issue, right? So as such, uh, I think uh, this will be probably a lot of investment opportunities, not directly in mining, but also in the mining supply chain side. So if companies who are providing or able to bring this uh, technologies, bring these investments to Mongolia, I think compared to 2008, once the really mining big projects were starting in Mongolia, now we have really clients, how to say, client base and uh, sizable uh, mining industry already available and number of clients. And I think it will provide also opportunity for companies from Canada and other countries to invest considering this angle as well. Thank you. Fantastic, Batsinger. Um, Tatiana, we've, we've gotten sort of a big overview and then we've gone to the, into specifics uh, of responsible business practice and then we've come back to an overview and pretty much given a complete picture, I think, with, uh, with James Abel moderation, we, we've tried our best. Back to you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Julian. Thank you, uh, all uh, speakers, uh, sponsors and supporters uh, of this event. Um, I'll take another 30 seconds to, to make a couple of uh, conclusion, uh, concluding uh, messages. Um, message number one is, is actually a, a very logical coming out of uh, the content of this, uh, of this event. And uh, this is a, a preparation uh, for a business mission to Mongolia, which we are actively discussing now internally. And, uh, um, it will be uh, further coming into uh, active planning sta uh, st uh, stage. Uh, so the, the mission will be uh, built around the Mongolia Mining and Oil International Trade Show in September. And uh, um, everyone who are interested, please connect with me. Um, I think I already left uh, a little message uh, in the very beginning of uh, our session. And uh, another uh, couple of messages is uh, about our upcoming uh, country focused uh, events uh, that we are planning on Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So Canada Kazakhstan um, uh, session is on Thursday. Uh, Canada Uzbekistan is on Friday this week. And uh, I think the uh, sessions are beginning uh, sometimes around nine o'clock in the evening, uh, in the morning uh, Eastern time. And the final uh, message is that uh, uh, we are also considering, our, our chapter in Alberta is also considering um, um, uh, to organize uh, a business mission to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And uh, please also follow our information to, um, uh, to see more. So again, thank you very much uh, for your patience, for your interest to uh, this incredible country, to Mongolia. And uh, I'm uh, wishing everyone who is in Mongolia right now is uh, a very productive day. And uh, for everyone who's in Canada, uh, good evening and good night. And uh, all the information that was pronounced in this uh, event will be available for you through our uh, YouTube and uh, through our website. And hope to see all of you very soon. Thank you. Bye.